What is happening, M0A Nation? Jason here, so blessed, so thankful, so excited to see all your smiling faces. Maggie, let's show some of those smiling faces. What's happening, John Masters? Look at that guy just chilling over there. Eric Ernest, good to see you. Rick Rush, Etro, good to see you. Tim D. Sexton. You, you, Tim, you know, when you put your middle initial in there, man, it just gets, you, you sound professional with that. Good to see you. Megan in the M0A shirt, fantastic to see you. Hey, Eric Pittman, rocking a 2-3 Mike Zulu shirt as well. Let's see who, I got so many pages of people to scroll through. Let's scroll over this page. Bill and Rob. Robin, you guys look so happy. I love that. James on the iPad. Fantastic to see you. What's happening, Scott? What's happening, Lisa Wood? Good to see you. Dave, Dave's still hanging out on the iPhone and he's just carting kids around, around Chuck E. Cheese, it looks like. I mean, he is, he is a champion. Mark Copeland. Hey, Mark and my buddy Mark in Chicago. Or where are you now, Mark? That's the real question. Hope you're doing well. Hey, you'll also see on here some of the great M0A team as well. M0A team, give a wave. There's Brian over there hanging out. You'll see the M0A team. Number. I didn't say flex, Brian. I mean, I don't, I don't want you to impress everybody too much. Uh, what's happening? Uh, Lane Cummings, good to see you. I saw you had a little one hanging out with you earlier as well. Ed K, good to see you. Jared on the iPad. Hunter Timco, I see you dancing over there. What's happening? That doesn't look like a hunter though. That might be Mrs. Hunter, Mrs. Timco. Good to see you. What's happening? I already said hi to TJ. Now I know your name's TJ, man. This makes life so much better. Hey, Jordan Stark, good to see you guys. This is just absolutely uh, amazing. Trevor, good to see you down here too, man. Anyways, M0 Nation, I am just so thankful um, for this. I know we haven't been able to get together at an aviation mastery event. We've, we've canceled them. We've canceled our cruises. We canceled all this, these fun gatherings that we do together. And I've just been looking for a great way to get out there, share just some of, uh, some of what's been on our heart lately, some of the, hopefully you perceive it as wisdom as well coming through. And, and I wanted to see your smiling faces. I mean, when I see Chris Stater, I know Jeff, Jeff is on vacation in Destin now. I see you over there, Jeff, as well, hanging out by the beach. I'm jealous of that. I'm just so thankful uh, that you all are taking time out of your day uh, to be here. So no matter how you ended up here, whether you saw it through the m 0 Nation Facebook group or you got the email, whatever it is, we're just so thankful you are here. And if you're not a member of the m 0 Nation on Facebook, I would highly, highly encourage you to check that out. We'll be talking about that more in a bit. So a little bit about how this is going to work tonight. First and foremost, we have some of the most amazing m 0 Nation team members on here. They have the virtual backgrounds that say m 0 team member. You can see those. So if you ever wonder what the mysterious coach Ray looks like, you can look at him now. I mean, we can over there, right? Let me show you this guy right here, this one right here. That, that is the mysterious coach Ray. I always talk so much about, he's got like seven dogs. He's just trying to keep at bay right now from not jumping on the webcam. I am sure you'll see the amazing team. You'll see Hunter and Curtis and so many team members that you probably interact interact with on a regular basis and be sure to private message them in the chat and just give them a shout out uh, and everything else as well. So very, very thankful. If you haven't figured it out yet, you can either turn this on speaker view to see me or you can pin this video and we're able to switch and everything else. If you want to see some of the team, that's up to you how you want to kind of, I don't know if you're on the iPhone or watch this on your computer, however you want to uh, set that up, you're able to do that. So uh, thank you to the m staff for working late and thank you for you all just taking time at your evening. So many of you are with your families. I see pets and, and spouses and everything else, kids, Everybody is welcome uh, tonight and just so thankful truly for that. So um, let's really dive into this here today. And I'm actually not going to give you, normally I give you my title of what we're talking about. And you know, we've been talking this entire month about the fundamentals. I'm going to save my title for the end, which I know is going to stress some of my note takers out. And I hope you will be uh, diligent in taking those notes. And what I'm going to share with you this evening is what I do. It is what the M0A team, who you can see on here does. It is truly the practical tools that myself and the M0A team and, and those ground school members watching this, I hope you're doing this as well. It's the practical tools we use every single day. And I want you using these too you know, as well. I'm not special. 
by the way. I, I am just a flight instructor who's willing to share uh, what I've learned and the data I've collected. But over the next hour, my goal is to make a dramatic difference in the way you fly, in the way you study. You know, myself and the team, we are here to serve you. So all I ask is that you play full out because you're going to get out of this what you put into this. So once again, if I ask a question, if I ask for a thumbs up, you give me a thumbs up back. If I ask you to wave, raise your hand, I, I, you just play full out with all of that. So thank you so much for this. And, you know, I'm so excited about you all being here too, because I can tell those who are really pursuing mastery. You know, those who come to me and say, hey, Jason, you know, teach me something new. Teach me something cool. Show me that, that new thing. I can tell those aren't the people who are truly after pursuing mastery. You can see it so perfectly illustrated if you go to like the M0 YouTube channel. What are our top videos? It's the number one, you know, top tip for landings, this secret for radio communications. Everyone's looking for these quick fixes, these cool landing techniques, these cool radio communication techniques, and they are helpful. But then you look at a video like in the fundamentals series that we're doing here, like the one I did called Know Your Airplane, which isn't a very cool topic. It's about what gives me a 90 knot climb, what gives me a 90 knot descent, pitch and power settings and all these things. But you know, I know every single person here watched that video because you wouldn't be here if you didn't. You see, to you all, the, the fundamentals, you're not bored by the fundamentals. You love the landing techniques, but you know that we have to get through the basics. We have to build the fundamentals. And through that, I really want to open up with a story. You see, learning to fly and learning to play guitar, learning to play any instrument. Show of hands, where are my musicians at? Any, any musicians out there, show of hands? Of course you are, Chris Stater. Rob, of course you are. Bradley's like so kind of, Coach Ray plays too many instruments. I get like a bunch of hands up there. I see you, John Schnell. All right, so some, you'll, you'll appreciate this analogy here. You know, I, um, I learned to play guitar a long, long time ago, and I'm by no means a good guitar player. And, and Coach Ray and Amanda are going to cringe that I'm even taking the guitar out right now, because the first thing Amanda's saying is, Jason, just don't, don't sing, Jason. Just don't, don't sing. And, and I'm an average guitar player. I can play a little ditty about Jack and Diane, and that's about where, if, unless you were born in the 80s, you're just not even gonna get that at all. Meg likes that joke, at least somebody likes that joke. Anyways, I'm, I'm just an average guitar player at best. Coach, I promise I won't take the guitar out again. He, he, Amanda and Ray were cringing, going, views are gonna go down if Jason sings. I just, I just know it. For the sake of everybody, I won't. But I remember when I was learning to play guitar, and I, I set up these lessons and I, I called up the gentleman. I said, hey, I'd like to book. I've never played guitar before. I'd like to book a one hour lesson with you. And he says, I, I don't do first time one hour lessons. Oh, OK, I mean, I guess you're the expert, but I, I'm like this more like, let's just do more. Let's do 10 hour lessons like that's my mindset. And that's not always the right mindset to follow because I only do 30 minute first time lessons. Okay, if you say so. And sure enough, he was right. Because anybody who's learned to play guitar, what happens when you've never played guitar before? I got in there, was practicing for about 10 minutes, and then my fingertips literally started to bleed. Anybody know what I'm talking about? My guitar players, bass players, you know what I'm talking about. You can spot a guitar player just by looking at their hands, right? They got calluses on their hands. So here I am, I'm, I'm all band-aided up after my 10 minute lesson, it's supposed to be 30 minutes. I couldn't even, um, I couldn't even practice that week simply because I, my, my fingers are all band-aided. I'm like, this is no fun, but I'll, I'll go back next week. And I go back next week and I'm able to play for like 15 minutes until my fingers once again start to bleed. And all I'm thinking about here is I, I didn't, I'm not learning to play guitar to walk around with band-aids on my hands. Right. I, I'm, I'm learning to play guitar so I can so I can make music and, and, and everything else. And the thing about this is I, I thought about quitting. I, I literally thought about quitting because it was just too painful. I'm thinking I'm not making any progress. My hands just hurt so bad. All I want to do is play music, not walk around with Band-Aids on my fingers all the same week. And thinking back to this story, um, I realized that flying and learning to play guitar are so similar. 
you see most people quit before they ever get their calluses. Most people quit flying before they ever get their calluses. Most people quit learning to play guitar before they ever get their calluses. Many people never get to their destiny because they can't work through their disappointment. And that is so true. Uh, that is so true of everything that we do. You have to realize, and I have a slide here I'd love to show you here. You can't get to the good part. You can't get to the good part without going through the tough part. You can't get to the good part without going through the tough part. And that is so true of aviation. And it's so true of everything that we really go to work through. You know, I was sitting down as I was thinking about this, and a good friend of mine, Keith, who was probably uh, out there watching that, uh, Keith and I had lunch uh, this weekend. And we were just kind of chatting and, and just having a nice time. And he happened to be in town and we were hanging out a little bit. And, and Keith's like a, a real pilot. When I say Keith is a real pilot, I mean, the man was shot off aircraft carriers and everything else. I mean, he was truly, uh, still is truly a phenomenal, phenomenal pilot. And he was coming through town and we were chatting. And he said, Jason, I get what you're talking about with mastery. I, I understand um, you know, we're, we're pursuing mastery. Mastery is a quest, not a score, on a test. Like, I understand all of these things. And I agree, a good pilot's always learning. But he asked me a profound question I didn't have the answer to. He said, Jason, how does a private pilot achieve mastery? You see, to a new pilot, the idea of mastery seems so big. Here I am just trying to build calluses on my hands and just get started. And Jason's over here talking about mastery. And I can't even get my calluses. I still got Band-Aids on my hands. How can you encourage someone at a private pilot level to pursue mastery? How is that even possible? He said, I thought, wow, you're right, because I've been preaching mastery for quite some years now. But to some of you out there, you're thinking, that's a big it's a big ask, Jason. I just want to fly safely with my family. I just want to be safe with, with my friends. That's what I'm really after. So I got to thinking, what does every pilot want? What does every single pilot out there want? And, and you know, you always got the email. We just ran a survey not too long ago. And it's very, very easy what every, what every pilot really wants. Let me just run you through a few of these here. Every pilot, we want... Well, I want flight instructors who care. Of course, we want flight instructors who care. Show of hands out there in Zoom land. Who had a flight instructor who didn't care so much? Can, can we see a show of hands? Tim, yeah, I see you. Chris, Megan, I see you. Let's scroll through a few more. Uh, yeah, I see you out there. Lisa, I, I've heard the story. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, I, I totally understand. It, it's, it's a struggle. We all want I just want a flight instructor who cares about my goals. I just want someone to be my accountability partner. Uh, by the way, can it be affordable too? I'd like some affordable flight training. I, I want flight instructors who are always learning themselves and always bettering themselves. Hey, I would argue flight instructors who are watching this right now are pretty darn good flight instructors. Uh, flight more, again, this is participation. Can my flight instructors raise their hands now? Where are my flight instructors watching this? Of course you are, Meg. Meg's a super flight instructor. I mean, that counts for something. Look around to who's raising their hands. These are the people. Hey, Jamie Beckett. These are the people you need to be hanging out with. These are the people. Hey, Ace, good to see you. These are the people you need to be hanging out with on here and, and working with because they're flight instructors who are always learning. And of course, we want real world training. So we'd say our... our our wants are very similar. These are all the things I want. But then again, going back to the analogy of how does a private pilot, Jason, achieve mastery? What do we all truly want? And if you look at it, everybody at the end of the day just wants one thing, but it sounds so basic. Everybody just wants to be safe. Every single person here wants to be the safest. They want to be safer, smarter pilots, as we always preach it. Yet. I think we're making a mistake. You know, we so often, the same flight instructors who raise their hands, I'm raising my hand with you there, we review accents for a living. You see Meg and Jamie and all my other flight instructors out there who are watching this and Hunter and Curtis and all of them, we like geek out sometimes reading this data and researching NTSB reports and, and, and working to get 
better and better. And yet too often, we simply just summarize. We simply summarize accidents into, that was poor decision-making. That was a really dumb idea. That was poor decision-making. And that statement is right. In fact, if you look, I bet, and again, I don't know the exact data on this, but I bet 97% of accidents have something to do with poor decision making. There's breadcrumbs of it somewhere. Maybe it was the pilot. Maybe it was a controller. Maybe it was the mechanic. It could have even been your flight instructor. Speaking of world famous Jamie Beckett, Jamie is famous for always saying, you know, the mechanics of flying are relatively simple. I mean, a high school age kid, I was that high school age kid, a high school age kid with average grades can learn to fly. But what's hard is decision-making. But the problem is when we use the phrase, that was poor decision-making, when you, when you look and you go, hey, Jonathan Schnell, that was, that was, you know, that accident was poor decision-making. Hey, Jordan Penning, you know, that was poor decision-making. Like you, it's so easy to just say that. But the phrase poor decision-making is actually what's called a tautology. Now, you're dealing with Jason Shepard graduated Westport High School with a 2.2 GPA, okay? I'm, I'm no English professor, but there's some English professors out there, right? And there's hope for some of you. If I graduated with a 2.2, you want to hear something funny? If you go, I went to Westport High School. If you go on the Westport High School Wikipedia page, it says notable alumni. And there's all these like football players who went on the NFL. And then it says Jason Shepard, aviator. And I think back, like, you guys barely wanted to let me walk across the stage and graduate. Now you're going to say, he's notable alumni. You're only good when you're good sometimes, right? And I wasn't good in high school. I was a bad student. I actually used to skip school, go through the airport fence to take lessons before Ocala was, was towered. So I never learned what the word tautology actually meant. And it essentially, it's saying the same thing twice, but in different words. In my opinion, I think, Right? That's a, that's a total, in my opinion, I think. You see what I mean? Or sometimes people say uh, they were in close proximity. Right? I, I'm close to you, and proximity means I'm near you. Um, you can get into it with acronyms too. Here's, here's a Jasonism. When people say, hey, can you go to the ATM machine? When it's the automated teller machine, machine. Like that's what you're really saying there. Here's an aviation one for you. Uh, why don't you call the ATC controller, air traffic controller, controller? You, you, see what, you see what I mean? But poor decision making is the same thing because we understand that a poor decision is defined as something that's just going to have a bad outcome. So saying poor decision making leads to accidents is a tautology because that fails to answer the real question. What's causing poor decisions? What's actually causing these poor decisions? Now, before I share that with you, I need to share some data with you because um, you all know I geek out over data and research. And in the early 2000s, NASA's Ames Research Center uh, embarked on a quest, actually, to see how CFIs teach weather-related decision-making. They worked with CFIs. They work with flight schools and they work with their learners all around the country. Remember, we're not students anymore in the FAA's eyes. We are learners. That is the new uh, FAA vernacular on that. So uh, it started out very simple. They went to the CFIs first, the flight instructors, and they gave them a survey. And they said, hey, CFIs, on a scale from one to five, one being very poor, five being mastery, how would you rate yourself in weather-related decision-making? And you know what the CFI said? They were fours, they were 4.5s, there were some fives in there, they were off the charts. I am a master, they said, in weather-related decision-making and, and, and their overall knowledge of weather. They then went to those CFI's learners, those, their CFI's students, same survey, and the learners, the students were much more modest. They were twos and threes. They're very humble. You know, like I know a little bit about weather, but maybe a two, two and a half, three. So you've got the CFIs. I am a master of my craft. And you've got their learners down here. 
two or three. I'm just a private pilot. I'm working on that. I'm, I'm working on everything. But then came the real interesting test. They gave both the CFIs and their learners, their exact learners, the exact same multiple choice weather test that tested for weather knowledge, that tested for decision making. Can you imagine the results? The CFIs and their respective learners scored exactly the same, average, right down the middle, like 2.78 was the data, barely a three in some cases. So here we have the, the CFIs who are calling themselves masters. They're teaching their students who just feel average. And then when we quiz them both, the learners were right. They're just average. And the CFIs perhaps thought a little too highly of themselves, maybe. You see, just because you've been doing something for a long time doesn't make you great. Just because I've been playing guitar for 20 years, I told Coach Ray I wasn't gonna touch the guitar again, I'm just doing this just to bug him because he's worried I'm gonna sing, right? Thank you, Eric Pittman. Um, just because I've been playing guitar for 20 years doesn't mean I am a great or even good guitar player. I can keep time, I can play some basic chords, I could play, we could have a jam session, but that's about where that ends. Just because you've been driving your car for however many years doesn't make you a professional, you're not Mario Andretti. Let me relate to something a little close to home. Just because someone's been married for 30 years doesn't mean they're an expert at marriage or have a fruitful, amazing relationship as well. Right, Just because you've done something for a long period of time doesn't make you great at it. And I need you to remember that because many of you get turned off when you get a brand new CFI and you think, man, they're awfully green. And you know what? They may be green. They may be brand new, but at least they're fresh off of learning, right? Sometimes you get these crotchety people, right? who have just, oh, it's my way or the highway. I've been teaching it like this since World War I. And, and they just go through their motions. Anybody ever have that flight instructor before too? I think, I think some of us have been there before. I see you, Eric Pittman, I see you. Yeah, some of us have had that flight instructor before. So just because you've been doing something for a long time doesn't make you a pro at it. But again, that still doesn't answer the question of what's actually causing our poor decision-making. So I thought to myself here, gosh, what causes poor decision-making? Well, what would Meg say? What would Jamie Beckett say? You know, that's what I think about. I think about these really smart CFIs when I try to come up with, with smart things here. What would they say? Um, it's difficult. It could be behavioral. It could be so many things. And then I realized that, you know, anyone who is a parent has certainly thought of this, right? Now, I'm only a parent of a six-year-old and a four-year-old, but sometimes kids can just be difficult. And if you look at it, if, you, if the kid is being inappropriate and you don't try to solve what led to the kid's decision, your child's poor decision, you're never going to be able to correct the behavior, right? You might just be trying to correct the behavior, but you're not looking back at what actually made them make that decision. You're just seeing the bad behavior. You're just seeing the, the child act up. You're not going back to what actually caused this behavior. It was the decision where it all actually went. You have to get back to the root cause of things. But, you know, isn't this so easy? Isn't it so easy to spot bad decision making in others while justifying ours? I have to be honest with you. I am an absolute professional at spotting your bad decisions. I am so good at looking at an NTSB report and diagnosing where everybody else went wrong. Who, am I the only one? Who else is really, really good at seeing stupidity in other people? It, it can't be, let, let's, let's, let's scroll through some Magda here. Can I get a show of hands? Who, who out there? Lisa, I see you. I see you. Danielle, I see you. James on the iPad. A nice, nice family. Good to see you all. Kazim, good to see you. Yeah, we're all better at diagnosing other people's bad decisions. In fact, we are so quick and so good at magnifying other people's problems while minimizing ours, right? I can magnify your problem. Bob, that was really, really dumb, but I can minimize my problems and I can justify my problems while protecting my mistake. After all, it's my mistake, right? I wanna keep my mistake. It's so easy to see bad decision-making in others, yet we fail to see it in ourselves. You see, we have to become a student of decision 
making. And decisions work the following way as we work to kind of bring everything together here for you. Every decision is ultimately a descendant of an emotion. And that emotion is a descendant of a thought. Let me break it into plain English here for you before we get too deep into psychology and everything else. What kind of thoughts are you having? How do you talk to yourself? Let me, let me ask you it this way. If you heard someone talking to your kid or talking to your spouse or your best friend, the way you talk to yourself, you'd probably go beat that person up, wouldn't you, right? Or if you saw Eric Pittman, if you saw somebody talking to me the way I talk to myself, man, that was stupid, Jason. Jason, that you are so dumb. Why would you, why would you do, anybody else victims of negative self-talk? Like Eric Pittman, you'd come over and say, don't punch, don't, don't talk to my friend Jason like that. And you'd punch him. At least I hope you would, Eric. Scott Hall, I hope you do the same. You look big and strong, just punch him, right? Sometimes we talk to ourselves the way we wouldn't let anybody else talk to our spouse or anybody else. You see, the science of good decision-making says that a decision made in a positive mindset, a decision made in a clear mindset is almost always the right decision. It's when we get in the negative self-talk, it's when we get in the doubt, it's when we get in the high pressure situation that you begin to second guess yourself. Who's ever done this in aviation? The instructor pulls the throttle back to idle and says, hey, John Masters, bad news for you, man. Your engine just quit where you're going. And John goes, I'm going to that field over there. And we're flying, flying. And all of a sudden, John goes, I, it, this field over here looks better. Let me head over to this field over here. And then go, but maybe, no, there's a road over there. Who has ever done this? And you've second guessed yourself out of so many landing sites that you made none of them. Anybody ever done that before? John Masters is shaking his head. I didn't mean to pick on you. You're just the first one on my screen, my friend. But I think we've all done that before. You second guess yourself. This is why I always teach. Listen, the, the, the landing site you choose first is the one you commit to. That's what you're going to. Now, when you get down to 500 feet and you realize those little, bl those little black spots were really cows, well, that's something you got to deal with and contend with. We don't have time to be deviating and doing S-turns out there. Maybe it's different. Maybe it's more serious than the simulated engine failure in flight environment. Maybe you made a no-go decision, but your friend was really saying, hey, you know, John Schnell, I really need to go flying today, man. I have to be there today. You promised me, man, we're going flying today. Why can't you take me flying today? And it adds to the pressure of things, right? And by the way, don't get me started when money is involved. Can I, can I share an embarrassing story with you all? You know some of my, my stories when I was you know, 18 years old, brand spank a new commercial pilot. It's the end of the month, the rent is due. I only get paid when the propeller's flying. I hope, does, has anyone seen uh, Captain Joel and Controller Bob? I hope they're not watching. Joel, if you're watching, cover your ears right now because it was in Joel's airplane. I used to have a job actually in, in 23 Mike Zulu, it's, it was 7159 Quebec at the time, uh, called Traffic Watch. And I would fly around Jacksonville, Florida, and I would report traffic accidents to a local radio station. I was Jason Shapiro, your high-end-sky traffic reporter. I had to put on a really cool voice and do all, all sorts of stuff, right? And just fly around, talking to ATC, I'm talking to the radio station, I'm flying the airplane, I'm eating my egg McMuffin all at the same time. I was very, very complacent in everything that I did. And I remember a very specific time where it was the end of the month, I only got paid when the propeller was spinning, and I went up and it was IFR conditions. And when I say IFR, it wasn't quite zero, zero. It might've been maybe up at a hundred feet. It was low visibility. Now I am a traffic reporter. I am to report traffic accidents for people's morning commutes to work. But I gotta pay my rent too, I thought, right? At 18 years old. Again, please don't ever repeat this. Coach Ray, you can leave this in the recording. It's okay, the, the traffic job isn't a gig anymore, so it's fine. I filed IFR, I took off, I got on top of the clouds, and I, I specifically remember, it is just a whiteout. And I remember flying over going, and if you look uh, to uh, John Turner Butler Boulevard, it's backed up to the top of the bridge. And I am just making up traffic reports as I'm flying on top of these clouds, just going up because my rent was due. And I, yeah, the visibility was low, and yeah, I had to shoot an approach in there, and yeah, I had a VFR-only job, 
but I had bills to pay. Sometimes when you add money to the equation, you make really, really dumb decisions. And that day people got really <laughs> inaccurate traffic reports. They're taking other detours and stuff because I'm just making stuff up at this point, right? So, but the thing I need you to realize, I know we can joke and have fun and, and, and everything else. Gerald, I'll see your, Gerald, I see your comment in the chat. He says, I like you even more now. I, I'm a normal human too. I, I, I made mistakes, right? I need you to understand something very, very important. And Chris Stater, you'll know where I got this from. Every decision has momentum. If it's a good decision, if it's a bad decision, it doesn't matter. Every decision you make carries with it momentum. Now add to it the hobby or the career we've chosen, right? I am hurtling through the sky at 90 knots. I literally have momentum in my decisions. Now, I know Rada and a few of my helicopter pilots are watching this as well, and you can slow down to a hover, but there's still got to be some momentum, right? We still have to keep that aircraft moving forward. So to better understand, if we know the seriousness of our decisions, because they carry this momentum, we have to work it backwards. If all decisions start with thoughts, and we know that thoughts are things and thoughts carry with that responsibility, our thoughts can lead us to the emotions, which is really the root of our decisions. Let me give you examples of all of this here. I've flown in worse weather before. That's a thought. Is that thought, I've flown in worse weather before, is that thought going to cause decisions in a good way or a bad way? Give me, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I've flown in worse weather before. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Megan. Hey, Catherine Hunt, good to see you. Absolutely, Felix. I like your background. Yeah, I've flown in worse weather before. Do you know that phrase came from? Um, it was actually the Mel Carnahan crash. Mel Carnahan at the time was the governor of, I want to say it was Missouri. Missouri people, correct me if I'm wrong. And he was running a very, very tight Senate campaign, running for state senator of Missouri. His son was his pilot. They're flying a Cessna 330, which is just an unpressurized 340. And I'm talking... They were doing five, six campaign stops a day. The weather was bad, but it was out there shaking hands, kissing babies, you know, delivering these speeches, everything else. I'm talking, they were within points of each other on the Senate race. They had to win. They had one more stop. It was at night. Missouri has some very remote parts. It also has some hilly terrain out there. And the line guy came over to Mel Carnahan's son, who was the pilot, I said, gosh, you know, the weather's really, really bad today. And the sun's famous last words, I've flown in worse weather before. And that was the last thing we heard from other than from, from ATC. You'll hear this again and again. Here's another thought. It's only green on the radar. Come on, come on, Russ Warman. It's only green on the radar. What are you waiting for? Let's go. Come on, Dave Ennis. It's just green. Let's go. Right? That, that's a, that is a decision you make that will compound and compound and carry with it momentum, right? Hey, Craig Ziegler, good to see you. It's only green on the radar. How about a famous one? Everybody better know, you know, better know it, but you probably know it. You've been following me for a long time. I want to do it alone. Who said that, right? JFK Jr. His CFI called him. His CFI called him on the phone, said, hey, Mr. JFK Jr., I know you've got to be at that wedding. I know everyone's expecting you to be there, sir. Um, you know, we can make it when you're IFR across countries. I'd be happy to go with you. His response, I want to do it alone. That thought caused an emotion, right? What was that emotion? Maybe a macho, hazardous attitude, which led to decisions that continued to compound and carry momentum. Those of you who watched In Flight Coffee two episodes ago, I shared about the Bonanza, number 555 Sierra Foxtrot, six instrument approaches he shot to the same airport trying to land when the controller was telling him, there are VFR airports right over here, just 14 miles away, please go over there. His words to the controller, I want to keep going until we get it. You know, when you're on missed approach number six, IFR pilots, I want to keep going until we get it. Just doesn't, um, it doesn't really work with me, right? But here's the thing. 
We have the power to change our thoughts. We have the power to change our thoughts, which now, note takers, brings me to the title of tonight, which is this, the fundamentals of focus. The fundamentals of focus. I see you all taking notes. Thank you for that. The fundamentals of focus. And we're gonna spend just a few minutes together here talking about focus and how we can apply focus to our thoughts which create our emotions, which create our decisions, which then create momentum. And this is true of your relationships. This is true of your finances. This is true of your aviation, everything else you work at here. It's all about where you focus on. And I want to give you an illustration to, to work on this. You all know um, the lovely uh, Magda, my, my partner in life and in crime and everything else that we do together. She's over here switching. She didn't want to be on camera today. Um, but she's over here switching, making everything work. And we run two cameras. So this is camera one that you see right here. Now, if I ask her, Magda, can we switch to camera two? And I have camera two over here. It's this nice zoomed in shot. And we run two cameras. If I want to make a point and, and you feel a little bit closer to you, I can look at this camera here. And when I want the main wide shot, we can come back over to camera one. And Magda controls that. But I can also control that too and ask her where to look with everything. But see, if I, Magda, why don't you go ahead and switch to camera two, sweetheart? If she switches to camera two, but I keep talking to camera one, and I am just staring at camera. I am focused on camera one. You see, everything's happening over here in camera two, but I am so focused on camera one. I'm flying aviation wise. I'm flying the same route. I'm on the same vector. I'm going the same speed. I'm sitting in the same cockpit. I'm talking the same controller to relate this to this present. I'm in the exact same room. Magda, why don't you put on camera, camera one now? I come over here and I switch, but now I'm on, I'm on camera two and I'm talking over here to camera two. I'm in the same room. You see, I haven't moved. I haven't changed. I, I, I've pivoted a little bit, but I haven't changed. What I have changed is I've changed my focus. I go, let's go back to camera one now. Again, I'm just looking at camera one. It's super awkward because I should be looking over here, but I'm not looking over here. I'm the same person. I'm the same pilot. I decided to change my focus. It's no different when the controller sends you on a vector that you don't want to go on. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go around that restricted airspace. Why is the controller sending me there? And you are thinking about everything else and you're looking around. And you're not checking your airplane. You're hurling through the sky at 90 knots or, or better yet, the controller tells me, hey, there's a gap in the weather. Now I'm basing my decisions on someone else's thoughts, someone else's focus. And until... I can say, hey, Magda, can we go back to camera one, please? And until I can change my focus, until I can be in this present moment, your focus will determine your outcomes. Your focus will determine your ultimate outcomes. Who in here, show of hands, rides motorcycles? Who in here, motorcycles? I'd like to be a motorcycle guy one day. A bunch of motorcycles, I like this. All right, cool, a bunch of motorcycles. Hey, when you were learning to ride motorcycles, what'd they teach you? You look at the pole, where are you going? You're going in the pole, right? You look, you don't look at the turn. You don't look at the pavement turn. You look through the turn. It's all about your focus. It's all about your focus when it comes to this. So I can have Magda on camera one, but if I'm looking over at camera two, my focus is off and I am missing the big picture that's really happening over here because my thoughts cause me to change my focus. And this is how students fail. And I'm gonna keep looking over here. I know it's super awkward, but it's meant to be awkward because this is how students fail check rides. You are on camera one and you just goofed up your steep turn. You're, you're right here, you goofed up your steep turn and, and they're still on camera one, but you're still thinking about that really bad steep turn. And you go to do stalls now and you goof up your stalls. And your focus is somewhere else when your focus should be right here. Your focus should be hurtling through the sky at 90 knots. That's where your thoughts should be. That's where your mind should be. That's where, that's where we get our ultimate outcome from. Let me give it to you uh, with some NTSB reports. Perhaps you remember this one. 431 Charlie Alpha. You might remember this one at Kentucky's Bluegrass Airport, Com Air 
lined up and took off on the wrong runway. You ready? The National Transportation Safety Board determines the probable causes of this accident to be the flight crew member's failure to use available cues and aids to identify the airplane's location on the airport surface during taxi and their failure to cross check and verify that the airplane was on the correct runway before takeoff. Contributing to the accident, you ready? Were the flight crew's non-pertinent conversation. That doesn't sound like they were very focused on what they were doing during taxi, which resulted in the loss of positional awareness and the Federal Aviation Administration's failure to require that all runway crossings be authorized only by specific air traffic control clearances. I've got more for you though. Here's related to a helicopter. According to the FAA's rotorcraft flying handbook, pilots, helicopter pilots have a tendency to make lower approaches at night when compared to those made during daylight hours. Additionally, pilots tend to focus too much on the landing area and not on their airspeed. And they'll tell you airspeed is still king in a helicopter too to avoid a condition called settling with power with your descent. Here's another one, 5326 Julia. The pilot observed a deer midfield on the runway during final approach to runway 17 and initiated a go around. On his second approach, the pilot's focus of attention was on the deer to make sure they weren't moving to the runway center. The deer stayed clear but the distraction put the pilot too far down the runway to allow a safe go around. Committed to the landing, the pilot applied the brakes immediately on touchdown, but grass skid was a problem. The aircraft went past the end of the runway, impacting two small trees, resulting in substantial damage to the aircraft. You see, these are examples of literal focus. And when I look at the wrong camera, that's literal focus. But the question I have for you is deeper than that. And we're almost done, I promise. Where is your focus? Is your focus here right now? Is your focus on the, your kids are screaming in the background? I can't hear them, don't worry. <laughs> right, that's where we have to look at the, the decision that caused the behavior, right? But where is your focus? Is your focus, gosh, I just wanna get this flight done. You know, I, I keep mentioning Jamie Beckett, but he provides so many good examples. He was just flying a 152 back from Texas. He left on Tuesday. Last Tuesday, he just got back yesterday, which was Monday, six days. Jamie, you could have driven faster. And I think he knows that, right? To fly a 152 back. And I imagine by the end of that, Jamie was probably saying, I just want to get home. I just need to get home. I just want to get, I am sick and tired of flying this airplane, right? But if you focus on that, Jamie, and everybody else who's been in that situation, anyone that's ever been stranded, if you haven't slept at an FBO yet, you will sleep at an FBO. You spend enough time in aviation, you're gonna sleep at an FBO one day. At least it's the, probably the right decision to make. Because sleeping in an Archer or sleeping in a 172 is not very comfy. You wanna go in the FBO. But if you have the mindset of, I just wanna get this done. I just wanna get home. I just want to solo, right? Why has my instructor not soloed me yet? I just want to solo. Or maybe, maybe you think, man, this is expensive, right? Or maybe you're thinking, does my CFI even care? Like, are they just here time building? And am I just a number in a system? Does my CFI even care? Or maybe you're thinking, it's just green on the radar, or I'm not that tired. These are all things you focus on, thoughts you create, and your thoughts become things. Your thoughts create emotion, which then turn to decisions. And let me tell you something profound. If you don't make a decision, a decision is going to be made for you. You are moving through the sky at 90 knots, most of us. Now, Jeff, you fly a Cirrus, and Coach Ray, you fly a Cirrus, so you're going a little faster than us, okay? No need to show off or rub it in our, our faces or anything like that. But you get my point. If you fail to make a decision, that in itself is still a decision. I was talking about this with the ground school members on the webinar today, where the FAA talks about a distress situation versus an urgency situation. And an urgency situation is something like minimum fuel. I declare minimum fuel and while it's not an emergency yet, it could become one. And if I fail to declare minimum fuel, that, that in itself is a decision, right? These things begin to compound and then it's too late. Next thing you know, you're on the news because you were landed on the road 
simply because you didn't exercise good decision-making. Your thoughts are thing, every single decision, good or bad carries momentum, but you see it all starts with a thought. So what are you filling your mind with before you fly? Because you're ultimately gonna get what you focus on. Do you feel you have to be there? Are you going into it with a negative mindset? Whatever it may be, what are you filling your mind with? Because you're gonna get what you focus on with everything. You know, failing to make a decision is in itself a decision. So uh, again, if I could have, and a big part of the Missouri Nation is we're each other's accountability partners. And I need every single person here to not only be my accountability partner, but I, I want to be your accountability partners. I want you to hold each other accountable with all of this as well. I know many of you are in the Missouri Nation Facebook group, and, and thank you. Um, thank you for that. If you're not, you can go on Facebook, just type in M0A Nation. It'll come right up so you can find it. We can use that to be each other's accountability partners. But can I have, can I have your word, your, your promise? I hope we get to meet one day. And whether we meet it on an airport ramp or an aviation mastery, whatever it may be, if you ever see me or one of our team members walking around doing their pre-flight inspection without a checklist in their hand or look like they're Russian or, or just screwing stuff up, can you come over and just politely say and just say, hey, Jason, you got to do what you teach, man. And I hope I can have the same with you. If I ever see you out there, hey, man, listen, we, we've got to slow down. We've got to make smart decisions. Can we have that? By show of hands, can we have that level of commitment? Thank you, Chris Stater. Thanks, Rick Rush. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Scott Hall, Jordan Pending, Gary Long. Thank you. I appreciate that. Because we have to be each other's accountability partners. And, and I would encourage you inside the Missouri Nation Facebook group or whatever it is, maybe you're facing a tough decision. Hey, guys, I'm going flying in two weeks and I'm looking at the prog charts. It's not looking so good. Or I'm going flying in two days. What do you guys think? I'm just a private pilot. What do you guys think? And we can work together. I mean, flight service stations can tell us a lot. But sometimes when we get an amazing group together, when you put you know, John Masters and Catherine Hunt and, and Gary Long and John Johnson, everybody all together. These are some smart people. And while you may not think you're super pilot, listen, you're not watching M0A because it's easy. You're here because you're pursuing mastery. And when we put our minds together and, and collectively, we can make smart go and no-go decisions collectively. So I'd encourage you to continue to use that as a resource, not just using M0A as a resource, but utilizing every single person on this call, every single person, that Facebook group, everything else as your resource to continue to grow and prosper in aviation. So with that, M0A Nation, I want to actually open it up for, uh, for some questions. If you all have some questions, I'm willing to, we'll see if we can get the audio to work to unmute some people. Magda's getting that set up now. We've got some hands raised already. If you wanna virtually kind of raise your hand, that'll allow us to see it if you have questions. While Magda's setting that up too, I wanna to chat and we'll pick somebody here if you, while you think about your questions. Um, if you haven't pre-ordered your copy of Aviation Mastery, the book, please, 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 Aviation Mastery. Um, dot com. It is, you know, my now 10,000 hours of flying, 10,000 hours as an instructor. Uh, the team's knowledge all culminated in one book, aviationmastery.com. Everything is a donation back to the M0A Foundation as well with this. So, hey, let's head over. Uh, I see a few hands raised. Let's, Mag, let's see if we can do this. So what will happen is I'll say your name. We're going to ask to unmute you. And I'll make sure I can hear you in my earpiece. Let's chat with, hey, let's chat with Vincent real quick, Mag. Let's go grab Vincent real quick. Hit ask to unmute. Vincent, on your end, you'll need to unmute yourself. And then let's see if I can hear you. Okay, Vincent, you there? Man, I got you loud and clear. Vincent, where are you watching from, man? Uh, just east of Philadelphia. 
just east of Philadelphia. Okay, I've spent a lot of time in, uh, not so much the Philly area, but a lot of time flying in and out of Harrisburg. Uh, that's like Arnold Palmer kind of area out there, I think, if I'm, if I'm correct, right? Uh, anyways, what's happening, Vincent? What's your question, man? So um, my check right is in, well, should have been for Thursday. Um, 100 hour kind of pushed it back. Um, so we're probably looking at next Thursday for private pilot check ride. Um, yes. I want to know from your experience um, and anyone else's um, that has taken their check ride, what is the best thing to do the night before a check ride? If let's say you have an 8 a.m. check ride, you're going to be nervous, but what is the best thing to do a night before a check ride from your experience? I, I love it. Vincent, let me ask one more clarifying question. So you're not talking, are you talking this Thursday, my friend, or we're talking after Easter the following Thursday, correct? Yeah, it, it should have been for this Thursday, um, but because okay. of the 100 hour, we're looking at next week. Okay, super. Let's let's do that. We can we can absolutely work through that. That's super, super easy. Mag, if we can throw Vincent back on, on, on mute there. Vincent, your question, my friend, we get that question a lot. And first off, it's easy to give the advice of, well, you know, Vincent, your instructor wouldn't have signed you off if he or she didn't think you were ready, right? And, and you get that advice all the time. It's so true. No instructor wants someone to fail. But the truth of the matter is, Vincent, tonight, for those of you watching this recording, it is Tuesday night. So we've got, a, we've got a few days here. We've got eight, nine days till Vincent's actual check ride. Here's what I want you to do, my friend. I'm never here to peddle our own stuff. And Vincent, give me a thumbs up if you've already got it. But you know we have passed, I don't have a copy of it, but you know we have our books, Pass Your Private Pilot Check Ride. This is the instrument book. You got it, you're nodding your head. You know it's on Audible as well. My friend, I want you listening to that book while you're walking the dog, while you're at the gym, while you're driving to work. I want you to immerse yourself in that. Vincent, you've got eight, nine days. I need you to sneak in two flights at a minimum, maybe three. And in a perfect world, my friend, you would sneak them in with another CFI because perhaps you've been doing all your training with the same CFI and you get comfy with your CFI. You're like texting buddies now, you go to lunch together, like you got a, a friendship going on. Sometimes when you hop in the cockpit with a different person, a little bit nervous about the whole thing. So getting a mock check right in ground and flight with a different human is going to prove very, very beneficial for you from that standpoint. So we're going to study all the way up to Tuesday. And cramming doesn't work, my friend. We're not in college anymore. Cramming doesn't work. Cramming works for short-term stuff, but it's not going to work long-term. And Vincent, I don't, although I don't know you very well, I know you wouldn't be on this webinar if you were looking to just pass a check ride. You're looking to be a safer, smarter pilot and a safe real-world pilot beyond all of this. So yes, you're going to pass your check ride of flying colors, but we're going to continue to prep for the real world. So now comes Wednesday night or Wednesday, just the day. Vincent, I don't want you to think about airplanes. My friend, when a plane flies over, I want you to do everything in your power to not look up at the airplane that's flying over. I know that's tough for, for you. That's tough for someone. Don't even look. Sounds like a 172. Don't even look up at it. Don't even think about aviation. Don't you dare listen to that audiobook. Don't you read anything about aviation. I want you healthy breakfast, healthy, healthy lunch. I'm talking no alcohol, minimize the caffeine, everything else, healthy, healthy stuff, my friend. I need you to get to sleep super early. I don't know what early is for you. If it's an 8 a.m. check ride, it better be earlier. You might need some melatonin or whatever to knock you out, but you need to sleep because you're going to be so, so nervous, but you have to sleep. Now, another factor to think about, Vincent, is Gosh, the check ride examiner is expecting me to plan an entire cross country. And I know just doing it on four flights is not gonna be good enough. I'm probably gonna have to do it by hand and get out the E6B and everything else. So Vincent, I would encourage you to do it, wake up a little bit earlier and do it that day. If you can, you got an 8 a.m. check ride, man. Can you get up at, can you get up at 5.30, get up at six, get going, healthy breakfast, the minimum amount of caffeine that you need, everything else. Get my flight plan out of the way and get it done. Get feeling good, work out, walk, whatever you need to do. Bring snacks to your check ride. Who knows what I'm talking about? You always bring food to a check ride, right? I didn't get to be six foot four by missing my snacks, right? Always bring food. Hey, oh, my dad's watching, Jerry Shepard. Hey, dad. Um, always bring food. Always bring snacks to your check ride because it's going to be a marathon, my friend. You start at eight. 
You're going to lunchtime. You're going to be hungry. We don't need you to be, you know, falling off the I'm safe checklist just because you're getting hypoglycemic over there. So make sure you bring snacks, bring water, everything else, my friend. That is my strategy. Now, Vincent, I have a request of you. If you're not already in the Missouri Nation group on Facebook, I need you to join it. And I expect, Vincent, a picture of you holding that temporary airman certificate with a big old smile on your face next to the airplane. Everybody on, remember we said we're gonna be each other's accountability partners, right? Vincent, every single person here, it's a guaranteed like, you're gonna go viral, okay? Every single person wants to see that picture, Vincent. So we're all counting on you, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> with that, super. All right, uh, let's take some more questions. Here's a name I see a lot. What about Jordan Stark? I see that name a lot. Now I get to see a face. Let's go unmute him, Magda, real quick. Jordan is going to ask you to unmute. Uh, if you can click it for me, Magda, please. Can you hear me? <laughs> man, I got you, Jordan. How are you, man? Where are you watching from? Uh, I'm from Boulder, Colorado. All right. I love it, my friend. I haven't spent much time there, but I would like to. So what's it's happening? What's your question? <laughs> um, my question, following up with private pilot checkride, is not digging yourself into kind of like that check ride pitfall. Um, I did kind of like an end of course with one of our instructors just a couple days ago. We were supposed to fly too, but I didn't get to fly because the weather that day. So we just did the ground portion and it's like we do a mock check ride and everything like that. I definitely learned that I give out more information than I probably should. And it just like keeps falling down from that point. So what are some tips that you or anybody has in not digging that hole, I guess you could say, or how to better explain um, something like even the electrical system? Because yeah, I was given out, yeah, we have a you know, 28 volt, 60 amp alternator, this and that, but how does it, you know what I mean? Explaining it a little bit better without digging in yourself into that hole. Man, I, I totally, totally get you uh, with that, Jordan. It, ma it makes sense. and. You know, we kind of pioneered that that phrase a long time ago, of saying digging yourself into a check ride pitfall. And just to give an example, of what Jordan's talking about, it would go something like this: um, the examiner would say, "Tell me about um, supplemental oxygen requirements, Jason." And you go, "Well, well, Mister Miss Examiner, let me tell you, that's ninety-one to eleven, and um, twelve thousand five hundred feet for more than thirty minutes. You know, fourteen thousand feet above." We, we, required crew, 15,000 offered to passengers. That's because we could get hypoxic and there's four types of hypoxia. What's the next question guaranteed gonna be? Four types of hypoxia, Jordan, that's so interesting. Tell me about that. And you go, um, well, there's hypoxic hypoxia, of course, Mr. or Miss Examiner, that's a no brainer. And um, so can I take a bathroom break at this point? I got an aeromedical issue I need to go handle, right? Well, that, that's how that works sometimes. That's what we mean when we say a check ride pitfall. And that's what we wanna avoid digging ourselves into. And Jordan, you look, look very young. So I'm gonna imagine you've never uh, been to like a, a deposition or something like that. But anybody who's ever been deposed before, what does the lawyer always tell you? Answer the question and zip it. Thank you, John Masters, you're right. Answer the question, Jason, and zip it. Yes, no. I don't recall. That, that's all the attorneys really allow you to say. Attorneys, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you get mad when you get someone like me or Jordan in there to depose. The other side loves it because we just were chatterboxes. Jordan, you have to take your check ride with a little extra salt. What I mean by that is you have to say, and you probably had to do the same thing for the written test, for the knowledge test. Before you answer the question, you have to ask, what is he or she really asking of me? Jordan, tell me about, and I'm not really asking, I'm just saying this. Tell me about the supplemental oxygen requirements. Well, we have supplemental oxygen requirements and there's three altitudes we need to work through. So at 12,500 feet, if I'm there for more than 30 minutes, required crew must be on supplemental oxygen. Above 14,000 feet, it's, uh, it's required. There's, there's no 30 minute rule after that. And then above 15,000 feet, I have to offer it to passengers. Don't get into, well, you know, you have to use aviators breathers, uh, breathing oxygen, which would come in a yellow canister, not to be confused with uh, medical oxygen, which comes in a green can, just zip it. It's awesome that you know those things, but just zip it. 
Less information is more, my friend. And it's so easy to do because you get so nervous. Show of hands, who was really, really nervous on their check ride? Who was like just tripping over themselves, just super, super nervous? Thank you. Thank you, Rick Rush. Good to see you. Of course, we're all nervous on our check rides. But my friend, you just have to zip it. Ask what question are they asking of me and sit there. And here's the other thing. Jordan, there is going to be awkward pauses. Let's practice. You ready? No one, no, don't say anything to me, Jordan. Just practice. Let the silence be. Don't be like Jason Shepard and feel the need to go, this is really awkward. I'm going to say something. That's a terrible idea, right? Just sit back and let it just, just bask in the awkwardness. The check people who pass your check ride. Am I, am I telling the truth? Aren't check rides the most awkward thing because this silence is so strange, but don't you dare say anything. It's like they do it on purpose. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if uh, Pat Brown and some of our Chuck Brown, some of our DPEs are watching. Why do you guys do that? I think it's part of their strategy. So anyways, if you want to chat again, you got to virtually raise your hand. So I get that. Let's go over to, let's talk to Jordan Penning. Then Dean, I'll come to you next. Let's go to Jordan Penning here first. Uh, let's unmute him. Jordan, where are you watching from, my friend? I'm actually watching from London in England. So it's, I, I, it's I 2 a.m. Eh? <laughs> 2 a.m. You are dedicated, my friend. I love this. I love this. What's your question, my friend? So I've recently moved airfields from outside of London into literally under Heathrow's airspace. It's absolutely crazy busy. What would be your advice in dealing with busy airspace? So let me ask a clarifying question before we put him back on mute, Magda. What is the issue? Gosh, Jason, it's just so busy. I don't understand ATC. Is it so busy? I'm worried about a midair collision, like all of the above. What, what's the issue here? It's more infringements and also mm. trying to get to places a little bit quicker, whether it's going through airspace or trying to go around airspace is so difficult. Uh, but it's just the lack of time trying to speak to air traffic control services to get to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So you are talking to somebody, right? Yeah, it just always. maybe uh, I just need to find my radio time, right? It's, yeah. just, it's a matter of it is just so busy. I, I completely understand, my friend. So let's chat radio communications here real quick. And, and I get what Jordan's talking about. Anybody who's ever flown in New York's airspace, you better know what you want to say and you better be ready to say it. You better have your thumb right here on that push to talk and get it before anybody else does. Anybody fly in airspace like that where you better, when you say it, you better say it quick. You better say it right. And I understand completely with what you're dealing with, Jordan. And again, your EASA rules and everything else pose some very unique challenges as well. My friend, these sort of things start on the ground. You perhaps heard me say this, that the best place to start briefing an instrument approach is back on the ground. If you're waiting until you're in the air, it is way too late. I know we're not talking instrument approaches here, Jordan. We're just talking transition and airspace. But Jordan, how can I start on the ground plan this out? I don't know, Jordan, if you're on in-flight coffee uh, this Saturday. I was talking, I, I talk a lot about how we always have the opportunity to change the script. We can change the script, right? Decisions carry momentum, but we can always change the script. But I shared this Saturday that we are also the script writers. When someone builds a house, Jordan, they build a house twice. They build it once architecturally on paper, then they go out and build it. When someone writes a movie, they script everything literally, then they go out and film it. Your flight around busy airspace, Jordan, is no different. I'm going to sit down with um, your version of four flight. I, the name escapes me. Uh, now Sky Demon, I think it is, right? Yes, yeah, Sky Demon. You're going to sit down with Sky Demon and you're going to map all this out. And you're going to say, okay, this is option one. And I'm going to fly this and I'm going to talk to Heathrow here. And gosh, Heathrow has three frequencies here. So, okay, I'm going to tune up both. I'm going to keep the second one in standby. I'm going to have the third one written down. Just so I'm ready to flip flop. I've got all this thought out ahead. Okay, Heathrow approach. I'm gonna ask this, this, and this. I've got that set up. Then transition this next airspace. And Jordan, write the script on the ground before you even get there. And guess what? Like all good plans, they don't always go as planned. So what's plan B? 
and what's plan C and how do we start on the ground and how do we practice this on the ground and how do we use services like liveatc.net to listen to other pilots that are doing this and transition in that airspace to practice and work through that. So that's gonna be just so, so important because I realize no one wants to have a violation. No one wants to, to sound silly on the radio. You also know, Jordan, I'm a big fan of advocating for a cold call. Man, in airspace like that, you don't cold call. They, you just call them, right? I mean, it, normally we cold call, but in that situation, you just you got to go in like a boss and, and talk to them. So great, great question, Jordan. Thank you for staying up so late. I promised Dean next, Magda. He's on your screen in the second row there. Hold on, Dean. We'll get to you in just a second. There you go. Let's see. Dean, my friend. Here he comes. Uh, you got to click it. There we go. Now you should be ready to unmute yourself. Dean, what's happening, man? Where are you watching from? Chicago. Chicago. I like it. I'm supposed to be, we now I'm supposed to be in Chicago like three times and that seminar just keeps getting canceled, but um, we're excited to get up there to see you guys, man. What's happening? What's your question? Um, well, first I want to just uh, let everyone hear that it's my first time and I want to thank everyone for making me a safer and smarter pilot, especially you. Oh. Awesome. Well, thank you, my friend. How is your flying going then? It's really good. I just got uh, 46 hours and on Friday, I'll finish off my solo and then I'll start my night training. Good for you, my friend. That's awesome. What's the goal? Are you going airlines, going corporate, You're just having a fun time? What are you doing? All the way to the airlines. I love it, my friend. Good for you, man. Good for you. Congratulations. And again, uh, congratulations goes to you. I mean, we play a small part in your big success, my friend. So thank you for that. Awesome. Super. Hey, Magda, let's head over to our mutual friend, Mr. Eric Pittman over there. I mean, he is just sitting there so patiently. He dressed for the occasion and everything. Mr. Pittman, I feel like I know you. Now I get to see you. What's happening, man? Oop, I can't, if you could be a little bit louder or, or check your... Is that better? Mic. Got you now. Got you now. Loud awesome. and clear. Yeah, awesome. man. So how are you? Man, I am I'm so very excited wonderful. to be here. I'm glad to like talk to you and talk to everybody. Um, I do want to say, you know, one thing, it, it, you, the seminar today kind of helped me out with a little bit that I can relate to work. Um, we drilled down to uh, figure out problems. We call it getting to the root cause. And so like getting to the root cause of, you know, more or deeper than, you know, just bad decision making. What really led to that is kind of right for me to uh, relate it to, to that. Um, well, it, you're, you're spot on, my friend. I mean, there is science that backs all of this up. And, and I hope some of you watching, we weren't just talking about airplanes. I mean, you know this, Eric, we weren't just chatting about airplanes. Yeah. We were chatting about relationships and finances and just life in general. So I, I get it, my friend, and, and, but, and thank you for that. Go ahead. That, that wasn't my question. I just wanted to say that. I yeah, yeah that. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. yeah. So um, hopefully, like Vincent, hopefully next a week from today, next Tuesday, will be my private pilot check ride. And um, I just kind of want to know, like going from there, um, you know, going straight into my, my instrument rating, what should I attack first? You know, should I get the written out of the way? Should I try to build time and doing cross countries? You know, what is some, you know, what's your advice on that? I'm going to give you very non-traditional, non-standard advice, my friend. And, and by the way, everybody watching this, we've got three check rides coming up, it looks like, right? Accountability partners, we're waiting for three Vincent, we're not, we didn't forget about you. We're waiting on three of these, you know, temporary airman certificate photos from you all. So I'm watching for that, Eric Pittman. Eric, uh, my advice to you is very different. You see, Eric, you have been, and I've been following your journey in the Missouri Nation group and on in-flight coffees every Saturday. Sometimes, and Meg and Jamie and Hunter and so many CFIs out here will tell you this, sometimes you get so into the training environment and it's this cross country and this practice area and, and this flight and back to back and, and everything else that I need you, Eric, to show yourself why you're doing this. And I know you know your why and you're very profound in that and smart, but Eric, enjoy being a private pilot, even if it's just for two, three weeks, take the family fly and take whatever it may be. I know so many of you, you've got the Jason Shepard personality. The day I did my check ride on Monday, Tuesday, I'm starting instrument. Yeah, that's cool. Like it, it adds, it, it, it sounds cool on paper, but you forgot to stop and show yourself that flying is fun. And this goes for everybody out there. Jonathan Schnell, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, you, you get it. 
guy, there are rusty pilots out here watching this right now that were rusty pilots because they lost their why. Their why was to go see the grandkids in Tennessee, but the grandkids moved too far away now or all grown up or stopped going to college where they were or whatever it is. Like they lost their why or a spouse said, you know, I really just, I'm not digging this flying thing anymore. And you become a rusty pilot and it happens time and time again. Eric, show yourself that flying is fun. Rusty pilots, show yourself once again, get your why back. But Eric, I, I applaud you for going into instrument, but enjoy being a pilot for a little bit, my friend. And, and I wanna see some pictures of the first passengers and everything else too with, uh, with that. So uh, hopefully that is very, very non-standard advice. If you want the actual advice, like what should you be working on? Um, Eric, I hope all your flights have VFR flight following. I hope you, you do need 50 hours of PIC cross country anyways. Make sure you're getting good at radio communications, my friend, because that will be a thorn in your side if you are not good at radio communications and think you're gonna dive into instrument with flying colors, it's gonna be an ugly, ugly, difficult start with that. So uh, great, great um, stuff with all of that. But um, uh, anyways, I hope you enjoyed your trip to the beach too, by the way, Eric, you were, I saw that, your in-flight coffee from the beach and everything else with that. So that's super. Let's go Magda to the only man taller than me in aviation, Mr. Chris Stater. He knew it as soon as I said it to you. You see him smiling over there. He knew, he knew it was going to be him. Chris is not only a phenomenal lifetime member, uh, he is Aviation Mastery alumni. And Chris, you are just such an asset to the M0A mission. How are you doing today, my friend? Hey, I'm doing great. I appreciate that, Jason. Um, good evening, uh, M0A team, M0A nation. I appreciate uh, everything that you've done in the past month as far as the fundamentals go. And I really appreciate the fact that you're concluding with really one of the most important things, and that's focus. Um, I find myself, you know, really focused most of the time, but then there's always the moments when you're flying over, hey, that's John Travolta's airstrip over there, honey, look at that. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're, you kind of wander a little bit and might miss something. So Give me some strategies that you use to kind of reorient, your, reorient yourself back to focus once you've found that you've drifted a little bit. Yeah, super, super question, Chris. And, and a lot of people struggle with this. Chris, you've heard me say this before, but this will be beneficial to everybody else. And I'll give you a different response as well, Chris. I play a really, really weird game when I go on cross country. Some of you know where I'm going with this. I play a weird game on a long cross country called, where would I go if the engine quit right now? Now, usually I don't tell my passengers I'm playing this game because they don't always like to participate in such games. So some of you don't need to be telling your spouses that you're planning for the engine failure ahead of time, but that's what good pilots do right? So I play a weird game as I'm flying along. There's John Travolta's house, okay? It's, uh, it's Greystone Airport. Jumble Air is the name of the neighborhood. And Chris, if I have an engine failure, I'm going to go hang out with Johnny T. That, that's what I call him. We're basically best friends. He doesn't know that yet. Um, so that's where I'm going, right? And we fly, we fly, we fly, and I'm going this direction. And then once that gets beyond power off gliding distance, I ask myself the same question. Where am I going right now? If my engine quits, oh, there's that really good field over there. And this helps keep my focus kind of moving at all times. Now, again, you can play this game with some of your passengers, but some of you, like I was given advice earlier, Jordan, some of you need to just zip it. Don't tell, don't tell your passengers you're playing this game, Catherine Hunt. Sometimes it just depends, right? You keep it to yourself. So Catherine knows what I'm talking about. The other aspect of this is I'm playing, where would I go if my engine quit? And then I also, even in 2-3 Mike Zulu, I have a 30 minute timer that goes off on the Avidyne. The easiest way to do this was the switch tank timer. Although you don't switch tanks in a 172, when it pops up in the Avidyne switch tanks, again, I'm always on both, so it doesn't matter. It's just a reminder to me, Chris, to do what I call the fat, dumb, and happy check. I never wanna find myself flying around fat, dumb, and happy. That, that's just not, that's not a position I want to be in. Fat, dumb, and happy is, gosh, my oil pressure has been slowly descending one PSI every 30 minutes, but I don't catch it until an enunciator light comes on. Or 
my battery has been draining over the past hour or my, my amperage is going down when I could have caught that trend. You fly around fat, dumb, and happy when you're going, that's John Travolta's house and there's Jason Shepard's house. They're not in the same caliber. I trust his house is way bigger, trust me, right? But you're flying around, you're doing all these things and you're flying around fat, dumb, and happy. Every 30 minutes, whether it's on your watch, whether it's on your Avidyne, your Garmin, whatever it is, how can you set up? Okay, let's just check everything out. Oil pressure, good, 72. Write it down, TJ. Maybe we write down oil pressure, 72. Keep an eye on it. It's just good to know. All right, temps, all good. You got, if you have an EI or JPI, can you be tracking CHT and EGTs and just really geeking out on the data that your airplane is providing you as well? Another thing I like to write down, you know I love to write down altimeter settings. Why do I write down altimeter settings? Because if I take off and it's 299 or two, and I fly a little south, and now it's 299 or zero, okay, no big deal. I fly a little further and Jack's approach tells me now it's 2985. And I fly a little further. I'm writing these down, by the way, so I can see the trend. That's what I want to watch for, right? Mark, I want to watch for the trend. And now it's 2980. Team, if I'm flying and the altimeter settings are getting lower and lower, I'm flying towards low pressure, which means what? Good weather or bad weather? Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, right? I'm flying towards worse weather. Thank you. Thank you for all those thumbs down. I'm flying towards crummy, crummy weather when it comes to that. These are things I do in my fat, dumb, and happy check. It always keeps me moving with that. All right. So hopefully that helps you, uh, Chris, and really appreciate all that you do for us. There is, let's, let's, take, uh, let's take a few more. How am I doing time wise? I'll be here all night for you guys. If you guys have to go, you can always catch the recording. But I, I wanna answer questions here. We're here to serve more than anything. Kazim, let's go, there's my buddy. I see this name so much and now I get to see a face. He, he did his hair tonight. I mean, he's got the airplane in the background. What's happening, man? Where are you watching from? Hey, how's it going, man? I'm uh, flying out of Orlando Executive. So I'm right here in Lake right. Mary, Florida. That's right, you told me that. That's right, man. So what's happening? What's your question? Uh, nothing much. I actually do a, a couple of uh, cross-country flights during my private pilot training was over to Ocala or over to Brooksville. So that would be my uh, my long cross-country flight, those two airports. Um, so I just recently got my private pilot uh, certificate back in September. And, uh, you know, as soon as I got it, I mean, I've had the bug ever since I started my training, uh, flying every weekend, taking up my closest friends and family, I was having a great time. Um, I told myself that my, you know, one of my biggest fears or regrets would be after getting my private pilot check ride would be uh, to become a rusty pilot. You know, I told myself whatever happened, whatever life threw out me, like I would consistently try to go up, try to fly like every weekend. Um, unfortunately, I haven't flown since January 17th and it's not due, due to personal reasons or anything like that. It's strictly due to weather. Uh, so now I'm sitting in, sitting here, you know, over two months and I'm contemplating, wow, um, at this point, I wouldn't feel comfortable taking up um, any passengers. At this point, I might have to go up with a CFI. Um, so now I'm sitting here um, thinking about my next flight. You know, I usually want to get in my cross country hours because I want to get my instrument rating done. Um, but I'm thinking, should I go up and do a cross country? Is that the best bet? Should I go up and stay in the traffic pattern? Um I'm not sure really what to do, or should I just go up and go to the practice area 15 minutes um, and fly back, you know, get accustomed to the pitch and power settings, to the way that the airplane flies. So what would you recommend after somebody that's, you know, a newly minted private pilot that's, you know, gaining a little bit of rust, wants to knock it off um, with a few flights once the weather catches back up, Florida is uh, super temperamental when it comes to that. So um, just trying to see how to go about that. And it's about to uh, it's it's about to get crazy too with uh, summer storms and everything else, my friend. And you know what, my friend, you're not the only one who's either been in this situation or is going to find themselves in this situation. So thank you for such an excellent question. Two months, feeling a little bit rusty. You've, my friend, you haven't missed an in-flight coffee or anything like that in a very very long time. So there's much, uh, you know, I I could share a lot here. Um, and a lot of it you've heard, and repetition is the mother of skill sometimes, hearing this over and over again. You've heard me say there's such a difference between a confident pilot and a cocky pilot. And right now you're neither though, right? You were certainly never a cocky pilot. 
but I hear you lacking confidence. And when we have that doubtfulness, thoughts are things we just learned, right? So when you go into a flight with the thoughts of doubt, I'm really not feeling so good about this right now. You know, God, I mean, should I even be flying? Maybe I should have taken my CFI. I don't know, you know, I'm a big fan of like the law of attraction and all sorts of stuff like that. And some of you all can call me crazy, but we built an entire business and philosophy around such an idea. And I realized that thoughts are things. You go up to somebody or someone comes up to me and goes, Jason, you look sick today. Do really, really do I look sick? And then you start going, I, I felt kind of sick. It's funny you say that. Next thing you know, you got a cold or something, right? I mean, it's crazy. You cannot go into a flight with this doubtful mindset. So here's where I need you to do, my friend. Yes, practice area be fun. Yes, pattern will be great. Yes, cross country might be a little bit much solo. You're in some, some prime finding pilot mentors and friend territory. Do you have a buddy? that you can go fly with, that you can split some time with? Do you have, I mean, I, I'm all about you paying a flight instructor to go up and fly. You know, one of the worst things, the things that bug me the most, I used to do a lot of flight reviews. And oftentimes I would do flight reviews with people and we'd go up and I'd say, all right, let's do some steep turns, some slow flight installs. And I'd always ask the question, so, um, so Martin, when's the last time you did steep turn, slow flight installs? Oh, about 24 months ago, last time I saw you, Jason, I thought, oh, you're, you're killing me, right, Meg? You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? It's like, you are killing me. So you're not there, man. You're two months, not 24 months. Let's go find a buddy that we can split some time with. Let's go fly. Let's, let's hop in the airplane you're most familiar with. And my friend, let's build up our confidence in small little doses. I cannot have you getting on an airplane in a doubtful mindset with this. And let me tell you something. Can we just ask the M0 nation right now, if you are in the Orlando area or even near it, or want to fly to Orlando and meet up with our buddy Kazim, can you private message him right now? Like we are a family and family takes care of family. So I hope you get blown up with private messages right now. People wanting to fly with you uh, because these are the kinds of people you want to be flying with. These are the kind of people you want to be buying airplanes with. You want to be joining flying clubs with like, these are your people. Look at that. Bradley's going to be in the Orlando area. Like let's, let's make this happen, my friend, so we can build that confidence back up. All right, let's go take some more questions. Hunter Timko, you've been waiting so diligently. I've been watching. The whole family has been on your camera, it seemed like. Everybody was just flying by. Uh, let's unmute you real quick here. We got to ask to unmute. Yep. I got you. How are you? I got you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm so wonderful. Where, are you, so wonderful. Where are you watching from? Where are you watching from? I am from Pittsburgh, about half an hour north. Uh, so Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, hanging out. How are you? Good stuff. Oh, I'm so excited. Sorry. <laughs> Um, my question for you, I'm currently working on my commercial uh, license. I unfortunately have to retake my commercial writ exam and I'm kind of putting it off. I'm trying to stay in that sweet spot with not too far that it's, you know, not so new, but also not rushing into it. And I'm really struggling on finding that sweet spot between being nervous and being unprepared versus being nervous because it's a, a check ride or a written. And I'd really appreciate your feedback on what I could do to go into it and, you know, be confident that I have studied as hard as I could or X, Y, and Z to go into it with a good positive headspace and what I can do to make sure I pass kind of thing. Yeah, I absolutely, yeah. I, I love this. Can I ask a question by the way? Um, what, what caused the 24 month lapse in the, in the commercial here again, we got to unmute you again. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, there wasn't a 24 month lapse. No, no. I, uh, just took my written about three weeks ago and unfortunately it didn't go well. So I'm currently in the stage of trying to get back to it. This is all very recent. This is just, okay. Happening. Okay. 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 I apologize. I was, I was in my mind, I was thinking you did the written and there's a 24 month lapse. We need to retake the written test. <laughs> and get the check right and boost some confidence in between. That, is that correct? Thumbs up if that's correct? Okay, super. Okay, awesome. It's very similar to what Kazim and I just spoke about of, I need you a confident pilot, but not a cocky pilot. Now, Hunter, you're also smart enough to know this, having just prepared for the written test, the knowledge test, that how you prepare for a knowledge test 
And how you prepare for a check ride are night and day two different things, aren't they? You've done two of them already with private instrument. They are so different. So I don't need you trying to study, study, study for this written test. And then by the way, get ready for my check ride and everything else. There is such a difference between, and anyone else who has a knowledge test coming up, understand me on this, write this down, whatever it takes. There is such a difference between understanding something and rote memorization. And realistically, I need you to get beyond even understanding. Please, I know there are, there are things out there that just basically create gouges. When you see 23 on there, the answer is blue, right? Like literally, there's gouges out there that can help you pass this thing. But I promise you, while you will pass, you will never have a true understanding. And my vision, my goal for you is not only to pass your written test, your knowledge test with flying colors, but pass your check ride with that confidence and that swagger and, and everything else that really goes with this. So here's how I want you to approach the written test, the knowledge test. Take each question. And just like I spoke with Jordan about earlier, take each question and go, what are they really asking of me? Now, I'd also imagine, Hunter, that you are an aspiring CFI eventually at some point as well. If I had to guess, maybe you want to continue. I see you nodding your head. Yeah, okay. You're eventually, your next certificate and rating is going to be teaching this to somebody. How, Hunter, would you now teach this to somebody? Okay, the questions about, well, let's use aeromedical factors again. The questions about aeromedical factors, how would I break this into plain English to teach this to a brand spanking new private pilot? You see, when you have to know something well enough to explain it to somebody else, it becomes a different ballgame. I will share this with you and other CFIs back me up on this. I didn't become a good pilot until I became a CFI. I barely snuck by private instrument commercial. Can I share something embarrassing? I got a 72% on my private pilot knowledge test. I was 16 years old. All I wanted to do was fly the airplane. I got a 70% on my instrument pilot knowledge test. By the skin of my teeth, I pass. I, didn't, I just look what I do for a living now. Isn't that, isn't that super, super ironic? Even my dad's a post in the chat saying, what? Sorry, dad. You had to find out someday. Anyways, I barely, barely passed the thing because all I want to do is fly the airplane. It wasn't Hunter until I became a CFI that I said, wow, I now have to break this stuff down into plain English to explain it to somebody else. So Hunter, whether you're explaining it to your spouse, to your kids, to your dog, whoever is going to listen to you, I need you to start teaching it to them and explaining these things through. The same is true of your knowledge test. The same is true of your check ride. And that's how I need you to start to approach these things because you're going to be a phenomenal CFI. It is within you. We just have to bring that out of you. And once again, you have an amazing, amazing team on here that are now your accountability partners. So I hope to see you in the Facebook group. Um, and again, continuing to work on that. So thank you, appreciate you. Let's, um, Daniel S, you have been waiting a long time and you are so patient, my friend. I appreciate you. Where in the world are you today, my friend? What's happening? Southeast Iowa. Southeast Iowa. What's your question, man? Yeah, appreciate uh, all your efforts tonight, specifically on the fundamentals of focus. Any tips, uh, still a newer CFI here, um, on how to get your students' minds, whether it's, yeah, they did something negative and that's all they can think about, and then they don't fly very well at all the rest of the flight, um, or whether it's something great they did and that's all they can talk about and they can't talk about the negative things um, on like a post-flight briefing any tips on how to kind of get their minds from one to the other or not overly focusing on one or the other what a, what a great question and once again here we have a handful of great cfis who in iowa it is 8 30 right now staying up late and just working to better themselves so thank you so much for that my friend you know this that you are a psychologist at the end of the day you cannot teach steep turns the same way to every person. You go to a big type A personality like myself, and I say, Daniel, man, show me, then I'll do it. Or Daniel, just, just tell me what, why we're doing this, and, and I'll do it. Like that, That's all I need. Then you go to an engineer, and the engineer says, well, 
tell me about this horizontal and vertical component of Lyft thing you were talking about. And, and I heard you say that Lyft is like a bank account. You keep giving this Meg lady credit for saying that because she's the one who says it all the time. Meg's over there dancing on camera, if you can see her. And the engineer needs all of those details. And then you get into the personality structure that you said. Well, you know, this person loves, man, I did so good. I am just on cloud nine, I'm rocking it. And then you have the person who can't shake that bad steep turn that they just did. As a psychologist, you have to learn their different personalities. Um, I'll give, a, I'll give a weird, cheesy analogy, but so many of you know it. Anybody who's, who's ever read the book, The Five Love Languages, you guys know what I'm talking about? Everybody has a love language. And again, it's a bestseller. Many of you know what I'm talking about. This, it, it sounds so silly, but can we come up with the five learner languages? So, I have to write that down for and buy that domain before somebody else does. The five learner languages. I hope Gary Chapman doesn't sue me or something. Um, she's really writing it down. I'm not kidding. Can we come up with such a thing? Because my love language is affirmations. Daniel says, man, Jason, that was a really good steep turn. I'm going, Darn right, it was a good steep turn, Daniel. It was the best one I've ever done before. Whereas the opposite is true, Daniel. It's going to crush me when you say, Jason, that steep turn was really, really bad. And just like the example I gave, I'm over here looking at camera two while we're still on camera one. Gosh, I wonder if that bad steep turn is still thinking about me because I'm sure thinking about it, right? It, it's just, you have to break them out of such a negative pattern. I don't know if anybody is a Tony Robbins fan, but Tony Robbins talks about when we get in these negative mind states, we have to interrupt our patterns. We have to break that chain. And Daniel, it's going to be important for you to interrupt that negative pattern. When you see someone having a negative pattern and you realize that you're no longer doing a service to them. In fact, their wallet is just flying out the window because they're paying for it. My friend, they're not getting it. You're going to say, hey, um, you know, my flight controls for a second. Let me show you something. And just show them a maneuver, just interrupt that pattern, show them something fun, do something fun. Or you know what, just call the lesson right there and say, you know, I, I, I wanna be, I wanna honor your wallet. And, and right now we're not, and learning is not taking place right now. Let's just call the day, let's pick it up in two days. Let's, let's work through this. And then when the power comes, Daniel, is in that post-flight brief. That day, the next day, hey, let's talk about what happened. Let's do Monday morning quarterback and let's work them through those sort of things. My friend, you're a psychologist at the end of the day. And I hope that uh, that helps you there. So thank you for that. Yeah, Superman, thank you. Joe, you've also been so, so patient. Looks like you're flying right now based on your background though, but let's go ahead let's chat with Joe over here. We're asking to unmute you now. Where are you watching from, Joe? I'm uh, outside of Philadelphia. Pennsylvania is just represented yeah. so strong here. My goodness. It seems it's like late for all of us. What's it, happening, it is, man? It is. Well, um, I feel like a perpetual student. I started in 2009 uh, learning and got to my cross country. COVID happened, of course. Uh, airplay or the uh, airport shut down. My CFI left. Uh, got a new CFI once things opened back up. We repeated a bunch of techniques. Uh, we did another dual cross country, fine, no problem, down to Cape May. And then the plane's engine cylinder blew. Five months later, the plane's ready to go back in the air. And now all of a sudden, every weekend, I'm getting pop-up TFRs. And I'm thinking, is this bad for me to be at this airport? Or should I move on to another airport and another CFI? Because it just seems like I keep hitting these roadblocks and it's a pain in the neck. Well, let me let me ask a follow up question. Is sure. it really is it really the CFI or is it just maintenance and then airspace and then COVID and, and all these other things? Is the CFI really a factor in this? So the first CFI was and no fault of him, an older gentleman retired. Um, so he was just there. Um, so even trim. Uh, so I fly in a Piper 140. He never, in 40 hours, even after my solo, I didn't even know how to trim the plane. When I got in with my new CFI, uh, he was like, yeah, why don't you trim the plane? I'm like, well, I don't know how to do that. So one of those, you don't know what you don't know. Um, you know, and I had soloed, I, I probably had six, seven hours of solo time in uh, before I even learned how to trim the plane. So uh, I'm concerned about 
uh, the school because it's now two CFIs at the same location. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Is this, like we were talking about previously, is this a pattern perhaps we need to watch for? Um, is uh, One more follow-up question, and then we'll put you on back on mute. Is, is traveling for a great flight in school or great flight instructor in the cards? Is that a possibility with work-life balance? It, it really is. I'm, I'm very fortunate. So I'm uh, maybe one, one hour west of Philadelphia. So from where I sit uh, right now, uh, not in this plane, uh, but from where I sit, uh, I have three flight schools that are within 20 minutes. And then Northeast Philly Airport is very close to where work is. So that's an opportunity. And I've real I actually called over there um, last week just to kind of start exploring that as an option. Yeah, I, I, I love this, my friend. And I will tell you, a flight school alive is worth the drive. Um, that's just not a catchy saying. Anybody who's traveled for a good CFI or good flight school will tell you um, exactly that, my friend. Uh, I would argue, again, I'm only hearing one side of the story. And, and you know, there's, there's three sides to every story, your story, their story, and the truth, right? And it's somewhere, somewhere in between. I'm not saying you're not telling the truth. I'm just saying there's always so many factors to this. What, no matter how thin you, you slice it, right? That's just, that's how we work with things. So Joe, I need you to put on your learner, your student pilot hat, and I need you to march down to those three flight schools. And I need you, if you haven't read the Private Pop Blueprint already, I highly, highly encourage you to pick up a copy, privatepopblueprint.com. It's free, just pay shipping. And I need you, because you, Joe, are the consumer. You vote with your wallet. And I need you to go, you might say, Jason, I'm already like 100 hours into this thing. What do you mean I need to go fly with three different CFIs? I want you to go do three discovery flights with three different flight schools and check out three different airplanes. Let me tell you something. When you walk up to that flight school, if you look at that airplane and think, if this was Enterprise Rent-A-Car, would I take that car, right? Because some of y'all look at some flight school airplanes and you go, this thing is like ugly, right? If I wouldn't take this from Enterprise, if I would say Enterprise, I need another car. This car's way, this car's got, it's smashed up. It's got bugs all over it. It is, you know, old, three times older than me. Find the school with the, with the good airplanes, the good maintenance programs. And then more importantly, the flight instructor, like I was just telling Daniel, that is willing to be the psychologist, willing to work with you um, on everything with this. So that's going to be my, uh, my attitude on that, my friend. Venture out to these good flight schools and commit the time, by the way. Take the two weeks off work, whatever you need to do uh, to really make that thing work for you. So I hope that helps uh, my friend. And you can see a bunch of, bunch of stuff in the chat, people helping you out there too as well. Let's grab a few more. Guys, I know it's getting late, but you know I would do anything for you all. Let's go talk to, uh, let's go talk to TJ. This is my buddy. I've been talking to him for, it feels like years now, my friend. Let's see uh, wh what's happening, man. What are you up to? Where are you watching from today? Well, I'm watching from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, I'm getting ready, getting very close to the commercial pilot check ride, just like uh, Hunter was uh, talking a little bit earlier. Uh, but I need a swift kick in the butt, I think, is what's really uh you know, necessary because I'm having a problem with being that perfectionist type pilot. Mm. I get more frustrated with myself than my flight instructor does with me. And I've been through three flight instructors at this flight school because unfortunately, you know, Horizon is a, is one of the Liberty university flight training affiliates. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the instructors are not just Liberty students. They're also, you know, military or have some other career field that they're also involved in. So my first flight instructor, who was an Air Force air traffic controller at Langley Air Force Base, transferred out, moved to another guy who was a prior Navy air traffic controller. Like myself, I was a prior Navy air traffic controller. And then he transferred out of the flight school when he got an you know, actual corporate job. And I'm on my third flight instructor now, who's also, guess again, former aviation mechanic in the Navy. So yeah. it's, it's just one of those things where it's kind of getting into this mode of now I've been away from the you know flight school for like 35 days doing nothing but 
ground preps and everything because weather has just been crazy up here in Virginia. What do I need to get over this hump? My friend, um, I'm going to give you two bits of advice. And by the way, I love seeing your photos in, in Facebook of flying with the family and everything else, man. I think it is, it is so, so cool. You keep that going because that answers your first question is, is what is your why? Like, why are you doing this, my friend? And I see it on Facebook. It's, a, it's that smiling family, man. You're taking them flying. You are following the advice I gave earlier that showing yourself that flying is fun. It's not all just, let's go to the practice area. Let's do steep turn, slow flight and stalls all day. Flying is supposed to be fun. I will also tell you this though, TJ, my friend, while there is very much a place for perfection in aviation, and perfection by definition is, is pretty darn close to never attainable. Perfection can be the enemy of execution sometimes. And I think if I, if I asked the spouse and I said, tell me about TJ and his perfection, she would say, well, the yard just has to be perfect and his car is always perfect and ev everything's just got to be perfect, right? I, I, this doesn't just carry over to your flying. So how have you overcome this in other aspects of your life? Sometimes, and I'm not suggesting, TJ, stop being the safest pilot you can be. Just, just relax a little bit. You're training at the highest standards to be a commercial pilot. And I know your goal is to one day become a CFI as well and start really giving back and help a community that gave you so much as well. Why can't we use that as our springboard? This perfection, while it's wonderful, is holding me back from giving the greatest gift that I can give, which is the knowledge I have right here. Don't confuse my friend perfection with mastery. Don't you dare do it because mastery is very, very different. Mastery is a good pilot is always learning without limits. Mastery is continuing to stay up late because I know it is 940 at night and everybody's got work in the morning, me too. And we're all a little bit tired, but we're sitting here because we're in the business of mastery and we're looking to learn more. TJ, I wasn't perfect tonight. I missed some of my notes. I could have made some points better than I thought. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to watch this again. And I'm going to get better from it. And through failure, we learn. And through mistakes, we learn. So rather than seeing your mistakes and beating yourself up, how do you see this mistake as, this is good because I got room to improve. You never want to be perfect. You would, you would hate yourself, TJ, if you were perfect, because you always want to get better, my friend. I see your failures. I see your mistakes. And I tell you that, man, that's a good thing, because I, I know you, and you're going to choose to learn from each and every one of those. Those that think they're perfect, those are the ones that hurt themselves. They're, they're lying to themselves. We, we read about them in NTSB reports. And I don't mean to be so, so verbose, I guess, with all of it and, and repetitive here. Um, but my friend, perfection is going to be the enemy of execution. Just get this done. You don't have to get it. Someone told me in business. So don't apply this to aviation just yet. Someone told me this in business once. You don't have to get it right. You just have to get it going. Now think about that from a business mindset. How many people have hatched business ideas but never launched them because it had to be just perfect, but that's not even what the market wanted, right? You don't have to get it right. You just have to get it going. And you guys saw that through beta testing of M0A and everything else. We still don't have our new learning management system right. But at least, at least TJ, we're playing the game. Everyone else can boo from the stands, TJ, but at least you and I, my friend, are down on the court. We're in the arena. Don't worry about the booze and everything else. They're not playing the game. They paid for the cheap seats anyways. So you got to look at things that way. It's just noise. So I hope that helps you, my friend. And uh, I hope you'll watch uh, In Flight Coffee this Saturday too. I know Jamie Beckett and I are going to be talking about some things that are going to be kind of right up your alley as well. So let's see. Let's take a few more here, guys. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Again, I, I can keep cranking all night here. Uh, let's go. We're going to go to Dale. Then we're going to go to John De La Cruz. I like that. And then we're going to go to Hezekiah after that. Dale, John, Hezekiah. So get ready, guys. And then Dan, I see you there. Don't you worry. I'm coming to you too. I promise. Let's go to Dale Williamson first. My friend, what's happening? Where are you watching from? Hey, Jason, can you, can you hear me? I got you loud and clear, man. All right, good. Yeah, Panama City Beach, Florida. All right. Handle. Um, I used to fly before 9-11. I was soloing and was doing cross country. Then 9-11 hit and been out of it. Last year, I volunteered on a B-17 for a couple of weeks and uh, kind of got the itch. So 
came back and started flying again. I've got about eight hours in. I'm about to solo. Um, both my flight instructors um, recommend you uh, all the, you mm -hmm. know, which is what kind of got me into M Zero Nation, which I love everything about. Thank it. you. Um, anyway, one thing I, I, as I'm starting to fly now, and I, I always landings is one of my favorite things. I love landing. I've watched your essentials, you know, five essential landings. Um, Super. But I, I like to come in, you know, instead of at 65, I always like to come in at 70. And, you know, I, I seem that I, I land just a little bit if I just leave a little bit of power in. Is that just a bad all the way around. I just should never do that as I, you know, as I just touch down, just have a little power in there or should I just, just, you know, as soon as I make the threshold, just pull the power back and that's it. Just make it touch. It's not, it's not that it's bad, Dale, that you want to come in a little bit faster. It's not bad. Some people want to, I'm going to use the word cheat and use a little bit of power, but let me answer your question with a question. Dale, what's going to happen God forbid, I hope this never happens to anybody watching this, but what happens when the most important landing of your life comes up because you have an engine failure in flight and coming in fast and coming in with a little bit of power isn't an option. It's a landing you've never prepared for because you've always chosen to come in with a little bit of power or a little bit more airspeed, and that's not an option now. And here you are about to make the most important land in your life in some random farmer's field out in Panama City, which it's mostly just woods out there. I've been out there quite a bit. It's, it's going to be a beach landing more than anything out there. You're about to make the most important land in your life, and you don't have your crutch. It's like you don't have your lucky rabbit's foot, right? I would encourage you highly, my friend, to do it the right way. When I'm in a position that I know I've got that runway made, that power needs to come back to idle. And I've got to practice my glide techniques and my energy management techniques. And it's going to take a little bit of time, but it's the right way to do it. I'm not saying you're doing it the wrong way. I'm just telling you there's a better way to do it. Forbid that ever happens. Great, great question, though. Let's uh, head over Mr. Dela Cruz. Let's head that direction. What is happening, my friend? Where are you watching from today, John? Hey, how you doing, Jason? Can you hear me? Great, man. Yeah, I got you loud and clear, man. Awesome. I'm in, uh, I'm in Montana right now, but I don't live here. I'm from, uh, I'm from uh, Delaware. I live in Dover. I'm uh, in the Air Force, so I travel a lot and whatnot. But I just, uh, I just recently got my PPO in January. Uh, it's been going great. I just got my high performance and complex uh, rating. Love it. Um, but here's my question to you. Being uh, being Air Force, we have to deploy. And with my job, I have to deploy here soon in May. So obviously, I won't be flying for six months. Uh, I do want to do instruments, but obviously, with the time frame, I just finished my PPO in February. I didn't want to crunch it up and then leave in May. So I'm, I'm planning on doing it after. Uh, but, you know, what should I do? in that time where I don't fly for six months, I was thinking doing ground, but you know, when I get back, you think that it's going to be rusty. I, I mean, I'll definitely probably be rusty, but should I take the time now to fly more? And then later, you know, kind of what, what would you do or what do you, any tips on uh, what I should do when I get back uh, from not flying for six months and getting, you know, in, into instrument. I hear you, man. First off, um, you know, from the M-Zero-A team, thank you so much for your service and thank you to all our, our active and, and inactive uh, duty members out there. It is, it is absolutely outstanding. So thank you for that, my friend. Um, I like the idea of ground. Now, I didn't ask the question of where you're deploying to. I realize internet may be an issue on where you're actually deploying to um, with that. But can we have past your instrument pilot check ride on audiobook? Can we download a few little things to take with you? Can you take a paperback book with you? The principle of disuse is going to sneak in in six months, my friend. So how can you not only not just do a little bit of ground while you're at it, but you're in the Air Force. How can we be hanging out with, with the pilots? And how can we be hanging out with anybody who's flying and just picking their brains? I mean, these are some of like the biggest and baddest pilots we have. Like, I want them as my mentors. So send them my way too. Like, I want to talk to them. Like, I think you're going to be so surrounded and immersed in aviation. It's not going to be an issue, 
but you're going to be around some cool dudes and some cool ladies. And I'd be reaching out to them and going, Hey, you know, I'm a private pilot. I'm working on my instruments. Um, you know, what do you recommend with that? How can you get some, you know, listen, I know it's military radios, but how can we be listening to the radios and just continuing to immerse yourself in aviation? That is where I'd be focusing, my friend. So well, thank you for your service. And again, see if you can bring past your instrument pilot check ride, whether it's as a paperback with you or an audiobook, and it's going to be an amazing service um, to you. Let's head over to, uh, thank you, my friend. Let's, uh, I told Hezekiah he's next. Let's go to Hezekiah right below him, Magda. Uh, and let's say hey to him. Hezekiah, what is happening, my friend? Uh, can you hear me? I got you, man. All right. Well, I'm 12 years old and I'm studying to be pilot, aspiring to be pilot. And I'm wondering if it'd be a good idea to, um, to like, buy like a radio and listen to the pilot's radio communications and get used to the radio communications. My friend, I, I love everything you said. My first flight lesson was at 12 years old. Um, and my father is on here somewhere in the, in the uh, midst of people that can, they can tell you that. There's dad, even put in the chat. Jason did that. Thanks, dad. I love him. Um, my first flight lesson was at 12 years old. And I was blessed enough to use that as a springboard to launch into a career in aviation and get a very, very early start. A handheld radio and listen to that is great, but let me keep some money in your pocket, my friend, because I want you spending it on discovery flights and flight lessons. Can we use a service like liveatc.net and just listen to it? Can you get the app for 99 cents and just listen to it that way? My friend, if you don't have a copy of the Private Pilot Blueprint already, please, please, please grab your copy. It's gonna cost you six bucks for us to ship it to you. And we'll get that out to you. That's where you need to immerse yourself. I want you watching In Flight Coffee on Facebook on Saturdays. I want you in the Missouri Nation group. You have got a, a mentor group around you here to learn from. I mean, I, we should have asked everybody their hours. I bet there's hundreds of thousands of hours on this call right now. My friend, you've got the peer group and this is where you need to be spending some time. So um, thank you for that and keep on dreaming more importantly. Hang out at the airport, by the way, if you have the opportunity. Mom, dad, just drop me off at the airport. I'll be okay. Just tell them that. I'm sure they'll be fine with it. Don't take my parenting advice either, guys. Anyways, Dan Carroll, what's happening? Let's head over to Dan Carroll now. Uh, Magda, on the far left, unmute him. There, we asked to unmute him. There's Dan Carroll. Where are you watching from, man? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm what I'm in uh, and, uh, really Oh, I got you. Uh, you're a little quiet now, Dan. If you can speak up or turn the mic up a little bit. Yeah, I'm got the mic on the camera here. Hold on. There you go. Yeah, it's good when you're close. It's good when you're close. Is that better? <laughs> Okay, hopefully that's better. Um, I'm in Ontario, Canada, and uh, just listening to the stories um, made me think of a couple of things uh, from my day uh, when I did my check ride. For those people doing their check rides, uh, one of the things that really helped me was the approaching it as if my instructor was my very first passenger. It, it. changed my mindset. It took it away from being a test to a cruise i got to demonstrate um, maneuvers and it just put me at ease allowed me to focus better so it ties in with what you're talking about focus um, it, it, it was just a much easier thing to do um, and it took the nerves away um, so i just want to thank you jason for everything you're doing i wish i would have discovered your videos and everything earlier in my flying career I'm, relatively low hours. I just broke that 100, 100 hour barrier not too long ago. Um, but I, I'm loving what you're doing and I really appreciate you. And, and thank you very much for everything you're doing. Well, I appreciate you, Dan. I appreciate you being patient too. I know we had a bunch of questions there and everything else. Let's take three more. Let's go to our buddy, Jason Bell. Then Ryan, I'm coming to you. Then Paul Murphy, I'm coming to you after that. Um, uh, Jason, give us just one second here. I want to also share... Uh, don't forget, everybody, I want you to head over. Um, we're going to do our big birthday bash. That just, it just hit me. I saw Amanda, and it reminded me of it. Uh, our big birthday bash. Amanda, is that page ready to go just yet? Do you know if you can give me it? It's ready to go. If you guys actually go to m0alive.com right now, you can RSVP for the birthday bash April 15th. 
You're not going to want to miss that. It's going to be another great live stream. If you love this, there's another one for you in two weeks. So m0alive.com. And with that, I will pass it over to the man in the m0a.com shirt. He wears it way better than I do, mostly because his muscles just look bigger. Um, Jason Bell, what's happening, man? Very untrue, Jason, but at least we've got good names, right? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, hey, guys, coming in from Chicago. I'm a, I'm a student pilot out of uh, Milwaukee, Chicago executive. Um, I'm actually, I'm doing my first cross country tomorrow, dual cross country uh, tomorrow afternoon. And my question is this, uh, you know, throughout all of my flight training, uh, you know, I have stayed away from using uh, like for flight in the cockpit. Um, my instructor always has an iPad so he can keep an eye on traffic and things of that nature. Um, but I'm just wondering where in the flight training process do you recommend we start to incorporate like an EFB and, and, you know, utilizing not just the GPS that's, you know, on the G430, the 430 in my, my cockpit, but having, you know, an actual iPad and, and, and how do you manage as a, as a student pilot, you know, trying to, kind of navigate and use your dead reckoning, your nav log, and then also having this focus, again, focus on, uh, on like an iPad at the same time. Outstanding question. I see a few in the chat, uh, Nandin and a few others and Dean all had kind of had the same question. And just to clarify, Jason, and again, great name. You are, like you said, getting ready for dual cross country, solo cross countries come and everything else. You're on the cusp of making that switch. I love, and you've heard me say this before, Jason Bell, because I've, I've seen your name a lot. You watch all our stuff, right? You're on the cusp of that. You've heard me say, I want you to learn everything the old school way. I want you to learn everything on the sectional chart, you know, manual nav logs, have that skill set to fall back on before you add something like ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot or whatever app, I don't care which app you choose to use, into the cockpit. Now, with that being said, Jason Bell, I need you to become pretty darn close to a master of it on the ground because that technology, Jason, is there to be a servant to you, not a jailer to you. It's meant to aid you in the cockpit, not cause you to fall further behind the airplane. So a mistake people make is, well, I'm gonna do my solo cross country. I'm gonna bring my iPad with me, but I've never, I just downloaded for flight the other day. I've never really messed around with it too much. Like you have to, get out there and use it. I shared a stat, and I think you were on the in-flight coffee, Jason Bell. Um, a Vemco insurance company shared, uh, I think it was last year, two years ago, I think it was 13% of their insurance losses were on the ground. 13% of their losses on the ground because of people head down, program the G1000, head down on the iPad, and they go and they schmuck a fuel pole or schmuck another airplane. That's my big word I've been using a lot lately, schmuck. I'm not, you'll never hear a bad word come out of my mouth, but schmuck is about as close as I'll get there. So, but that's the problem. We can't allow that to become a distraction with things. So you're on the cusp of it. I, I would solo cross countries. I like you using it to assist in your paper nav log. Let it sit in the right seat next to you. Don't even have a kneeboard yet. Just let it sit there and do everything the old school way. And then iPad, confirm it, okay? Set it back down there. It's not a distraction. It's an asset. It's not a distraction. And that's where we need to get with everything, Jason Bell. So I hope that uh, helps you. And again, have a backup in case of that, Jason Bell. Can we have it on the iPhone as well? And just have it in the right seat. It is like it's your co-pilot over there helping you out with that sort of stuff. So that's super. Okay, Magda, let's go to Paul, then Ryan, and then Sierra, I see you just raised your hand. So Paul, Ryan, Sierra, and then we're gonna wrap on that, uh, everybody. So um, let's unmute Paul. Paul, what's happening, man? Where are you watching from? And what's your question? Uh, watching from uh, Central New York, Utica. Um, my question is, I don't know if you've, uh, I don't know if somebody's already asked it and you didn't really touch on it, um, but I also forgot the resource that is the, uh, I'm zero away Facebook group, so I don't want to go too in depth with the answer. Um, how I haven't, I haven't, I haven't started um, uh, flight training. So, what would be the most affordable way to do so? Um, just a couple of things. No, I I love the question and. The two killers of flight train dreams are time and money, my friend. You have one, you don't have the other, and vice versa. And uh, if you have not grabbed a copy of the Private Pilot Blueprint just yet, privatepilotblueprint.com, someone from uh, the MZRA team put it in the chat. 
I'm telling you, this is where you need to start. How many people use the Private Pod Blueprint? Show of hands out there. Super, super. I love it. Thanks, Pete. Good to see you. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I love it. Um, it's how to save time and money in your flight training. And there is a balance to each. And while affordable and flight training don't always go hand in hand, we can, we can mix quality with affordability is what we can really, really do there, Paul. So I hope that uh, that works to serve you. And I hope to see you in the nation as well. Magda, what are the odds that Eric Deagle raises his hands like right as we're going to get ready to say hi? He's over there smirking too. Let's see. We, we might save him for the end. Let's go over to Ryan on, it's, it's Ryan's iPhone. I mean, the guy's on an iPhone, so I got to talk to him. I mean, I am, I am biased to Apple. Let, let's unmute him. Ryan, what's happening, man? Where are you watching from? Hey, man, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you, man. Okay, I'm over here in Greenville, North Carolina. And I'm kind of midway through my private pilot. I'm about to do my, my solo. And I'm kind of hitting a wall on figuring out how to balance studying for the rating. The, the flying the plane, as you say, comes a little bit easier for us, like hands-on people. You know, if, I, if you can just show me and do it, we can do it. But having to explain like the oral part of like, like the pre-check ride of the plane, you know, the maneuvers and all the knowledge that you're supposed to regurgitate all while trying to, you know, fly the plane with your instructor, which sounds like I'm blessed when it comes to the CFI. I got a really good one, but mm -hmm. I kind of get like, you know, just kind of like, it just leaves you in that, in that moment, you know, so not, I come home, study like a few questions I have, I get like really zoned in on that. And then he asks us like a simple question, like, what do you need in your wallet before you get in the plane? And you're like, uh, you know, driver's license. Obviously you need a medical certificate and your, you know, your student certificate, but it's just like, how do you balance the study? He's recommended the ACS. I've got a folder here. I wanted to show you the ACS is not really short for private pilot and, and it's got <laughs> two sections with like subsections. So can you help me out? <laughs> That, that darn FAA giving us such a big ACS. I blame the oh FAA, God. Ryan. That's, that's, what I, that's what I blame. No, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you, my friend. And, and listen, in a perfect world, Ryan, I wish we all would have gone back, done ground school first, learned everything, and then figured out the application side where we went to actually fly it. You're doing what I did, which is flying, enjoying that, not enjoying the ground so much because flying's super fun. Ryan, you're gonna ha you're gonna come to a point if you're not already there. It sounds like where you're flying exceeds the knowledge that's up top, and that's a dangerous thing. Like that's how you end up in airspace you're not supposed to be in. That's how you're trying to make radio calls you don't quite know how to make. I, I it's the right advice, although it doesn't sound fun. Is it might be time to just tap the brakes a little bit and say, hey, listen, time out. Love flying. I'm gonna fly once a week now. And I'm going to get back and I'm going to really commit to these ground studies. I know, and you've got to think about it differently too. I hear ACS, I hear check ride. But Ryan, you're not really studying just to pass a check ride, right? You're not, you wouldn't be up this late at 10 o'clock at night if you just wanted to pass a check ride. You want to take the spouse flying. You want to take the kids flying. You want to be a professional pilot. Like, the check ride is just a tiny little speed bump to get over until we get to that ultimate goal. What was our theme uh, this month with our YouTube videos? It was the fundamentals. And I talked about building the foundation. Right now, my friend, you've got a little bit of a sandy foundation for your ground knowledge. And while it hasn't bitten you yet, good for you for recognizing it. It's time to sure up that foundation a little bit because here's what happens, Ryan. Again, you don't wish an emergency upon anybody, but if an emergency were to happen, well, when panic happens, when emergency happens, we fall back to what's called primacy, which is what I learned first, right? That's what's most deeply ingrained. And if you don't have that foundation, when things hit the fan, you're gonna be hitting the panic button when you should be going kicking into your training and everything else. And I'm not trying to like scare you straight or something like that. I'm just trying to tell you that man, I, I want to see pictures of you on Facebook with the, with the wife and with, with the kids and just with the friends and just having a good old time enjoying aviation like you should. Don't think check ride. Think I'm taking my family to Florida to go hang out with Jason one day on a cross country. Like that's how you need to be thinking about things and mapping out your goals. Get back time out on the on flying other than maybe once a week just to keep fresh and keep yourself excited. And you got to get in the ground studies.
check rides one thing, but real world is a different, different ball game, my friend. Last question is yours, Sierra. Bring us home strong. Let's go unmute Sierra real quick. No pressure, but it's the last question of the night. What's happened, Sierra? Where are you watching from? Hello, sir. I'm in uh, Clinton, Missouri. Um, awesome. I have a question pertaining to like uh, instruction and focus. I'm still a little bit far from being a CFI, but that's my big goal is to be a CFI, a good instructor. Um, right now I'm a skydiving coach, which is like a baby instructor. I teach the, the ground school beforehand. And I was wondering like, how do you balance um, focusing on the student and his learning style as compared to like how much you focus on the material? You understand wow. what I like? I, how, how do you balance that? I understand exactly what you're saying here. And let me just, let me repeat it back to you. So we are on the same page. If we can unmute her just one more time, Magda. Um, are you essentially saying that I, Sierra, know that what happens in the book and what happens in the real world are different sometimes. How do I help bridge that gap, essentially? Is that what we're asking in a nutshell? Um, kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's the, the student's learning style. I want to... Um be like personable to the to the student have him learn but also presenting the material can I don't know I'm, I'm having trouble finding a balance on which to focus on it's it's a great great question I understand what you're saying here now and still what happens in the book what happens in the real world does apply to such a situation here we're asking about learning styles and there's actually not a lot of science that backs up learning styles it's more actually learning preferences of our learners, visual, auditory, everything else that we can work through here. The type A personality, the engineering personality. I, I've shared that a million times. You can't teach steep turns the same way to every single person. You can't just also do grab the ACS and say, study the ACS, like we just spoke about in the previous question with Ryan. Like it, it doesn't work that way. The ACS is so dry. The FAA material is so dry. Sarah, you have to become a professional at breaking complicated things into plain English. And that's what it really comes down to. And, and that is going to benefit you as you work and say, okay, how do I, how do I, Sierra, make aeromedical factors relatable to this individual? Well, they're a doctor, so that's super easy. Or maybe they don't have a strong background in that. You have to simplify. You know, one thing we did when we came out with, we re-released all the check ride books. You notice at the top of every new check ride book, it says your instrument check ride simplified, your private pilot check ride simplified. And that's what learners are really after, Sierra, is I want to be the safest pilot possible. I want to be prepared for each and every scenario, but give it to me simple. I need it in plain English and preferably in my learning preference as well. Show me, explain it to me, whatever may work with that. So I hope that, uh, I hope that serves you and helps you with that. By the way, Megan, I see your birthday hat over there. It looks really, really good. You are prepared for the, for the M0A uh, birthday party with that. So um, listen here, um, M0A Nation, you are incredible. And I apologize for going two hours, but I didn't intend to talk for two hours. It just happens sometimes. We are gonna be, we are live a lot, by the way. Every single Saturday, In Flight Coffee, it's on Facebook. I hope you all already requested to join the M0A Facebook group. Head over to m0alive.com to make sure you're there for our birthday bash as well. It's the 14 year anniversary of m0a.com. Gonna do a lot of great fun giveaways, uh, just share some great history of where we've come from and where we're going and of course, great simplified aeronautical knowledge, Sierra. So that'll be there for you as well. But listen, I, I would stay up another two hours if that's what it took till every, uh, every question got answered. You know myself and this amazing team that I have around me is here to serve you in any way possible. I hope tonight we just saved one life. That was my goal. That, that was my prayer before we started is just help me save one life tonight. And I hope that happens. And, and you know what? We may never, ever know such a thing, but that was the mission tonight. And I hope that is mission accomplished with that. Be mindful of your thoughts this week, this month, and the rest of this year. The world it can be a negative place, 
with the media and everything else out there. Be mindful of your thoughts. Be mindful of where you give your focus and where you give your attention to, not just in the cockpit, but um, in your family and your relationships and everything else, because thoughts truly are and become things which then relate to our decisions. I'm Zuri Nation. I hope to see you all this Saturday for episode uh, 52 of In Flight Coffee. I'll be joined by world famous Jamie Beckett of AOPA as well for one year of In Flight Coffee. I can't wait. I see all your comments in the chat. I'll go back and read those when we're all done. So thank you for those kind words. Listen, have a blessed, amazing, abundant evening and just continue to be a blessing and a light to one another because we live in a dark place sometimes. And I encourage you to be a beacon of light to others. Not an airport beacon because no one can ever see airport beacons. They're just not bright enough. I need you to be brighter than the airport beacon, okay? Have an amazing night, everybody. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great night, everybody. I'll see ya.